Let me let Hubert know. All right. Uh, hold on. Hey, Hubert. Okay, oh. everyone. Hello. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. I changed so, a little bit. I, I, I had to change it also. Bit. Yes. So, Definitely. hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Israel Palestine SoCal Patriots debate. Uh, this has been a pretty heated topic amongst uh, many of us online across the nation, really. Um, Arthur, are you still there? Okay. Well, I hope uh, I'll explain what we're doing. So, basically, I have Arthur here with me, Arthur Shopper. He is a uh, Israel supporter. I mean, he's also an American patriot. I've known him for a long time. Hey, yeah. So uh, real quick, um, I just want to uh, let everyone know, like I said, Arthur is here with us, and I apologize. We're, we kind of got a lot of things going on. I got people yeah. going in and out of my house, and I'm looking at my phone. But Arthur was gracious enough to join me for this Israel-Palestine debate that we uh, discussed on, about having today. Um, we talked about it today. We basically got together and uh, agreed to kind of hash things out, discuss things. Yeah. Um, Arthur is a well-known voice, a voice on the SoCal Patriots movement. Um, I have my own reputation as well. And I think um, it's important for us, even because we have actually, you know, sharply uh, diverging opinions on this topic. It's important for us to get together and I think hash this out and have a debate where both sides can be heard and um, the merits can be fleshed out because as conservatives, we're purported to believe in a marketplace of ideas. So um, we're doing that in that spirit. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and explain how the um, debate's going to go and then we'll go from there. So sure. uh, there's going to be first the introduction. If you don't mind my... Go ahead. I'm going to just say something positive. So, you know, I called in, I, I got a, I got the text from Nick and said, would you like to have a civil discussion about the Israeli, you know, about Israel, but, you know, broaden an Israeli Palestinian conflict. And I said, okay, I called, but I didn't want to, I didn't want this to wait. I said, let's do it now. And he said, well, hold on a sec. We want to be able to broadcast it somehow. And so he adjusted and was willing to do it pretty much on the spot. And I adjusted by allowing him to eat and, you know, get ready. So, I just want to say, you know, Nick, you reached out and I said, let's do it. And you were willing to do it right away. So that's good. Well, I appreciate it. And I Arthur, and go ahead. So, yeah, no, thank you very much. And uh, you've been a good right. sport. And we, we, I think I hope this will be a useful discussion for everyone. So um, yeah. there, since we don't have a moderator, um, we're going to have a kind of a formatted discussion. Uh, first is going to be introductions where Arthur will be allowed to introduce himself. I will briefly talk about myself and then we'll go into these various topics. The benefits of an Israeli-American partnership. Okay. The morality of the Israeli-American relationship, dual loyalty, fact or fiction, is American aid necessary for Israel any longer, should America intervene militarily if Israel is threatened, and conclusion and prognostications for the future. And interjections or rebuttals will be allowed um, as they okay. come in. Obviously, we just both have to, you know, keep it civil and abide um, abide by, okay. you know, being, rules of etiquette. So with that being said, I've spoken enough. So, Arthur, go ahead and introduce yourself. Then I'll say some words and then we'll get into it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. My name's Arthur. I've lived in California all my life. Um, I'll, I'll just put forward some basic positions. Um, I believe Israel has a right to exist. Um, I believe a two-state solution was already established. Jordan on one side, Israel on another. I think people are not responding to that question properly. Do you support a two-state? Well, there's already there already is one. Um, I I don't think. Uh, I hope that we talk about this. Um, you know, it's it's gonna maybe it'll fall under the dual loyalty category. And I'm I'm recording this. I hope you're recording it. So I might be repeating myself a little bit. No, please do. Um, I. You know, I, I will concede special shout out to Compton's Finest. I mean, I still get educated about the, the internecine conflicts of this fight. Um, I, I recognize now, yeah, okay, Israel created Hamas to try to, to destabilize the PLO. Boy, that didn't work. Um, I think it's, I think a lot, um, okay, that's getting into debate, my bad. So positions, Israel has a right to exist. Um, I don't I don't believe in a so-called Jewish question. I think that there's more sinister forces. It's not just an ethnic question. Um, uh, I do recognize that, you know, Israel's done some bad stuff. Um, every government does. I think we have to distinguish between the people and the government. Um, I, I'll just get this out of the way right now. Uh, all right. If I could just say introductions, us so just keep it to you, and we'll get into this in the debate. I just that's all due respect. And, and last of all, um, you know, Nick's controlling everything. I'm a guest, um, more or less. I just want to put that out there, and I'm recording it. So let's see what happens. Well, yeah. I, okay. 
I am in control, but I think you'll find I'm a fair arbiter. So with that okay. being said, um, I'm Nick Torres, and uh, I'm an American nationalist, uh, right-wing activist located here in Southern California, um, proud Trump supporter, uh, Roman Catholic, and um, I'm here to basically argue on behalf tonight, honestly, of the Palestinian people, who I find to be a loyal and noble people, and um, to, I think, highlight the uh, dangerous and detrimental effects of America and Israeli, uh, the American and Israeli partnership. So um, with that being said, um, I think we should kind of get into the uh, nuts and bolts and the brass tacks. Uh, we've spent enough time introducing ourselves. Um, so the first thing I think we should talk, and uh, Art, would you like me to go, or would you like to start on this, uh, the first topic? The one thing that frustrated me, I, I went off, you know, I went off a little bit because I wanted to go to your text message. So what's the first topic? Oh, yeah, no, no, you're fine. I was going to repeat it again. The benefits of an Israeli-American partnership. That's the first topic. Here. Okay. And, whether, and what you think they are okay. and if there are any and, and that kind of nature. Sure. You know, I, I think our starting point, I, you know, I had an intense discussion with Trevor Loudon and he's, I, Trevor Loudon, I agree with him 95%, but he's all in on Ukraine money. I disagree heartily. Now I'm not pro Putin either. I think it's I think it's these problems are too complicated to choose a good guy and a bad guy. Zelensky sucks, sucks. Putin sucks. You couldn't pay me to live in Russia either. We shouldn't be spending money anywhere on any country. Um, and I think it's important what's happened. We're going to see Israel can take care of herself, and that's appropriate. Um, it's unconstitutional. We got to get back to George Washington. Let's have very tenuous alliances at best. Let's be in peace. And if we're at war, then we got to defend ourselves. Um, having said all that, um, you know, we, I've seen um, Israel helped attack ISIS. They attacked ISIS in the Sinai Peninsula specifically. The New York Post reported on that. Um, Israel provided intelligence during the Iraq war. I, I am a recovering Bush guy who I did support it. I see it was wrong. We shouldn't have gone in. I only assert that Bush never lied. Now, someone can still disagree with me about that. I don't think Bush lied, but we shouldn't have gone in. Okay, so I can just consider see that right there. That's the only thing I want to put out there. The WikiLeaks cables confirm it. Um, I think uh, Israel is the breadbasket for Europe. Europeans get a lot of their food from Israel. This is something I learned from Pat Condell. He's the atheist who says really sharp, cool things. Um, what I've seen is, you know, Israel is a stable democracy in the region. It's the only stable. I said stable because Iraq's supposed to be a democracy, um, give or take. Um, so there's that as well. I think there's that kinship that's worth recognizing. Um, I understand, uh, you know, is Israel has provided us intelligence. We provided it to them. There's incredible technology that's come out of Israel that we've received. Uh, I, I think that's stuff that we can't ignore. Our smartphones, a lot of the technology comes from Israeli, you know, from Israeli scientists, Israeli researchers. Um, you know, so as far as our what our ongoing relationship should be, you know, I, I don't think we should be giving them money. Uh, the, in the, fact, the, benef I, the benefits of it are, that's what I'm saying, just kind okay, of sum so, yeah. up your position. Yeah, benefits, I mean, yeah. they're, they're, an, they're, an, they're an incredible force for counterterrorism. They keep Iran in line. Worst comes to worst, I want Israel to do the fighting against Hezbollah and Iran. I don't want American anything involved. Let Israel do it. I'm cool with that. So um, that's how I see the benefit. They are a nice countervailing force against that terrorist aspect, and they help go after ISIS. So those are some things. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I have a pretty divergent view from you. Um, I don't really think there's any uh, strategic benefit to the Israeli-American partnership. I think it's actually a antiquated relic of the Cold War. Um, we first kind of really got buddy-buddy with the Israelis because the Soviets, and actually the funny thing is the Soviets were the first country to recognize um, Israel. And uh, but anyways, we recognized Israel and Israel decided to pal around with us and become a client state of ours. And you know, there was, I guess, some people can argue some use for that during the Cold War. But um, since then, at least the 70s and 80s, uh, Israel's been a horrible detriment to the United States. and um, the benefit of relationships, like I said, I don't really see any. Um, Israel conducts mass espionage in the United States, as attested by Jonathan Pollard, who received a hero's welcome by Benjamin Netanyahu at Ben Gurion uh, International Airport for spying on the United States. Um, they've also stolen American nuclear secrets. Um, this has been confirmed in the, but, uh, the Apollo affair. We're allowed um, to rebut, correct? Go ahead. Um, the Apollo affair, that's actually been challenged, and those scientists were exonerated. So that's not true. Regarding Mr. Pollard, I, I agree with you. I think Mr. Pollard probably should have been executed. I'm saying, yeah, that's well, that would be great. But, you know, that's that's not why. I, and I and I here I am. I'm being my pro the same. Sorry, okay. Well, I don't know. It's, it's tough. No, 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 yeah. Aside, aside, from all that, though, aside from all that, I mean, 
I'm not familiar with anything about the Apollo <laughs> fair scientists being exonerated or anything like that. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of questions. Okay, wait a minute. Into, but nonetheless, you just said you're not familiar with the Apollo affair. Okay. No, I, no, I said I'm not familiar with the Apollo fair scientists being exonerated. But yes, anyway, they were. so they didn't. Yeah, they didn't well, I'll look into that, them. but that's not what I've heard. But anyways, I let you speak. Did you want to talk about the Obama okay, affair? Because that's what Nick Fuentes did. I mean, Arthur. Arthur. sorry. Can I just finish my point? Sure. I let you speak, didn't I? Thank you. Sure. All right. So, um, again, there's really no strategic benefits. Uh, they've committed a lot of uh, acts of espionage in the United States. And I know you said you wish Jonathan Pollard was executed, but the fact is he wasn't. And he was basically spying for the Zionist entity Israel in our own country. Um, I believe they've stolen nuclear secrets. They've also sold okay. military secrets of ours to China. That's been also confirmed um, for many years. And when you said that they uh, helped fight ISIS, they actually didn't help fight ISIS. There's a lot of evidence to attest that actually they helped sponsored ISIS, they according did. to the New York Times. And aside mm -hmm. from that, um, like you mentioned earlier, they were um, uh, basically what critical and their assistance was essential in forming these more radical Palestinian groups like Hamas. Okay. And it's really come to bite them in the ass today. So um, overall, my argument, can I just, I'm oh, sorry, just let me finish real quick before you rebut. You spoke my overall argument. More than I know, but okay. No, no, no. The overall, basically, benefits of our relationship with Israel, like I mentioned, there is none. Um, they're a duplicitous ally. They uh, cause tension and mm -hmm. problems for America around the world. Uh, they make us look bad in the Islamic world. And oh. um, I think there's many You're questions. You're making assertions. I'm not allowed to. Am I going yeah, to be allowed to count? No, okay. go ahead. That was my that okay, was so, okay, I you, you just acknowledged about the Apollo affair that you didn't know that the scientists were exonerated, and they were. Well, that's um, the question. We I about, mean, that's, no, I'll have to look in that art, but true. I've never heard of that before. Talk to Jacob Wolf. Um, yeah. He'll fill you in yeah. on it. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll go look so into that. There's that. I'm I mean, not even, I, I have this not is going to be tough, and we're so, doing the best. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I can, I can finally get this off my chest. You know, the Levon affair, I studied that. Um, you had some creepy people do a deep state operation that killed some Americans. The Knesset condemned it. The prime minister condemned it. There was widespread condemnation from the general Israeli public. They didn't support that. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting, usually when people are anti-Zionist, they will talk about the, you can name the ship, please. The What's the name of the ship? Liberty. They will talk about that. Well, um, I was more than happy to be informed about it. I've studied it at length. There were not one, not two, but there were 10 commissions that investigated the USS Liberty and what, and the results were, the Democrats instituted this, by the way, John mm -hmm. Conyers from Michigan, for example, they, what they found was that there was, it, it was not a deliberate attack. Israel told everybody to get out of the sea. This was during the six day war. Everybody, if you're not familiar with it, yeah, the, the admiral, yeah, the official the story is that it was in there doing the Eastern okay. Mediterranean. I yeah, wanted to ahead. speak and you interrupted me. Yeah, yeah, so I'm just, I'm just telling you that I know that there are veterans to this day. They have the USS Liberty patch and they will swear up and down that Israel did it on purpose, but they the final words they will say is, I can't prove it. They can't. The final, the latest commission was in 2007, and uh, the most hostile anti-Israeli participants said, we can't prove anything. Israel paid an indemnity, and this I thought was very interesting, because a lot of people talk about a so-called Jewish lobby running foreign policy. The United States government had a 20-year period of stasis, which is actually a hostile state with Israel. And that was not resolved until 20 years later. So first of all, the notion that Israelis are pulling strings with the foreign, you know, foreign policy establishment is not persuasive. Second of all, these incidents have been dismissed. You acknowledge that you didn't hear about with the Apollo affair that they were exonerated. They were. We received technology. We received, we received support. I believe they helped inform us when Iran connected with cartels to try to take out some Saudi ambassadors on our soil that was mm -hmm. in 2000 so they helped us too regarding isis you can go to the new york post i'm mentioning the new york post which exposed hunter biden you're mentioning the new york times which well it's the new york times but you know what then again that's not quite fair truth is truth if two if new york times says two plus two equals four it's still true so fair we can say that but that's my response to that um we have to look at today if we care about you know, we want to have a strong relationship with Western allies. Israel's providing most of the food. Um, we're seeing a growing, there's actually a growing Christian movement, and that might go into the dual loyalty question. This, I think that's what this is really all about. I am not going to play the anti-Semite card. That's not an argument. But I think when there's hostility to Israel, in all too many cases, the real hostility is, I just don't, they just don't like Jews. And I think that's an issue that yeah. needs to be addressed. So, again, I mean, you're saying that the uh, scientists in the Apollo affairs have been exonerated. Who exonerated them? So, for, uh, there was an investigation, and they were... Who, they were who conducted the investigation? 
So you're going to have to look into that further. Who, who did? I mean, you're, you're an expert on it. Who did? I'm not saying I was an expert. I'm just saying that they were exonerated. I can't remember the source. So right you're now. just, you're just, but you don't have any, any no, mission I, or anything I, that exonerated them. You can look into it if you want. I will. But no, it, I told you I was, but you're, you, I mean, you, you said like you knew you were an authority on it. So I, I didn't say I was an authority. Sure. And, I, uh, never you know, that. again, in I'm terms prepared of sharing to intelligence, wrong. I think you mentioned that sharing intelligence. I mean, Israel has shared us faulty intelligence. They, their false intelligence about mm. uh, nuclear weapons being in Iraq led to one of the most detrimental and awful wars in U.S. history, which you acknowledge, which you acknowledge in your recovering Bush guy, as you said. But I mean, <laughs> that's a point against them. And sure even, even also, I mean, in this mm -hmm. recent attack, which we'll get into later on in the debate, mm -hmm. um, it's widely recognized that Mossad and other intelligence agencies were wholly incompetent and couldn't okay. basically track or figure out the movements of Hamas in the lead up to this. And this is in a group mm -hmm. that's basically operating out of a small strip on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian coast, right. where it's totally bugged, totally surveilled. I mean, that's not really a testament to their competence. I wouldn't want to work okay. with them in that way. So that's kind of my sense on that. Go ahead. So so just to just to wrap up regarding the intelligence question, there were five yeah. agencies that indicated there were WMD. I'm still I still assert there were weapons of mass destruction. The Washington Post reported it. WikiLeaks, the WikiLeaks cables confirmed it. That doesn't justify going in because the perfect response is lots of countries have WMD. We don't invade them. Duh, exactly. But that doesn't mean it was wrong. The 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 weapons were shipped to Syria. I don't want to re I. You know, yeah, yeah, we don't need to relitigate it all that. We just, yeah, so I, I think so there's, one, there's, one other point, there's one other point that I wanted to talk with you because you said there's, you, I think you kind of are insinuating that the, uh, uh, the, like kind of the insinuation that there's, uh, you know, a Zionist lobby pulling the strings in our I say there policy. is one. I say yeah, there is one. Okay, there is. I mean, well, there. I mean, first off, there is a Zionist lobby overall in the country. I mean, there's there's literally the Zionists mm -hmm. of America. Okay. There's APAC, which is the American Israeli Political Action Committee, and they're not the okay. sole lobby. Obviously, the, all these organizations and networks form a broader Zionist lobby. So there is that okay. obviously, and these groups have worked. I mean, if you look, there is track record, there is papers, there's think tank discussions like the Clean Break Memo. Uh, let me just finish. I'll let you go. Can I finish real quick? Thank you. Sure. I'm just holding so, my hand um, for the, the signal. Yeah, no, no. I'll let you know. So, yeah. So, like, and I'm sure you've heard about it because I remember you debating uh, Nick Fuentes and other people. And I'm just saying, so I'm sure you're familiar with these arguments. But, like, you know, when uh, the Clean Break Memo came out in 1996, when Benjamin Netanyahu first got into office, look at all the people who authored that. It was like Douglas Fife, uh, Richard Pearl, all these various people, all prominent Jewish neoconservatives, people who were kind of in favor of this hawkish stance in the Middle East. Go ahead, Arthur. I'm going to ask a question. Go okay, ahead. I'm going to ask a question. You answer, then I'll respond. So that memo was like an ideal foreign policy template, I believe. Is that correct? Like yeah, what they it wanted. Was, uh, it was called the clean break, and and I'll think. Can I finish my point before we respond? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, yeah. And, and then what I wanted to say was, so, but it was called the clean break to to secure the realm. And if you look at all of the countries that were listed there, there was mm -hmm. like I think a list of nine or eight or nine. I can't remember the exact number, but the interesting thing is most of them were like Syria, Libya, mm -hmm. Iraq. Um, Iran, which Iran has faced many color revolutions and many other types of uh, forms of subversion recently with like the Green Revolution. And you can obviously yeah. argue too with uh, these recent events. So mm -hmm. all I'm saying is, is that there is a track record of Zionist influence on our foreign policy. Okay, that's, also that's the issue I want to speak yeah. to. Okay, so APAC, these are Americans that, hey, they, they love Israel. They want money spent on Israel. Zionists of America, America too. Yeah, they, yeah, no, go ahead. They're free free to spend their money as they see fit. I consider myself a Zionist. It's based on it's based on a biblical foundation. Um, it's not based on a political foundation. But you um, asserted I, earlier, I mean, and I don't, and you're recording this too, so I mean, if I'm I false, you can feel free to correct say this. Yeah, yeah, but, um, but you said there was no Zionist lobby? What I meant to say, okay, yeah, let I mean, me correct did, it. What I did say, say that, is, though, right? What I mean I'm to say, to get, say is, yeah. okay, what I mean to say is, and I'm allowed yeah. to correct myself if I wasn't clear. What I'm trying to say is that this idea that the Jews or that there's some Zionist group that is controlling, directing, and implementing their policies, that I don't agree with because APEC, well, I mean, you just look at it. You've got the so-called jihad or, you know, you've got the Hamas caucus in Washington that is very powerful. They haven't been removed from office. Here's something else that's interesting too, especially with Republicans, just a fun story. In the late 1970s, you had a Republican congressman in Illinois. He was Arab and he was pro-Palestinian. And he was defeated by a Democrat, obviously, named Dick Durbin. 
So it was a Democrat that knocked out a Republican. So it just shows that the political connections of Israel, Palestine, whatever, are a lot more convoluted. It's not just Republicans are for Israel so, only and Democrats And also, so we, so you're, when you mentioned the Hamas caucus in Congress, you're talking about like three female House of Representatives members against like the other... I mean, there's 535 members in Congress total, so right. or 533, I think now. So, so I mean, that's that's three sure. versus 530. I mean, I, I wouldn't say they have a lot of influence, and you know, I would disagree I really, because you look at eight members that were able to vacate along with the Democrats. It was yeah, those eight but, but, you know, that were able to yeah, vacate. I mean, aside from that, too, but you mentioned too about like the questionable nature of Jewish influence on American foreign policy. I mean, let me just talk, not to segue away from this topic, but to bring it to well, a let's stop right point. there because, because that goes to the dual loyalty thing, I think. So let's go back to that, that issue. Well, is, no, no, no. I just what are the benefits touch, of let me, the Let me just touch on it. I mean, you said, you said earlier I'm controlling well, hold on, hold on. Right? That first yeah. issue was, was what are the benefits of the American-Israeli relationship? I've answered that, I believe. Did you have any questions All right, yeah, we'll, about that? We'll say that then later. Let me, and let me, well, I'll wrap this section up, but we'll save that later. So, so okay. my belief is there are no benefits. Okay. Um, they're a duplicitous ally. They spy on us. Um, they go we to spy on them too. Wars. <laughs> they go we to some the foreign wars. They sell our military we weapons to enemies of ours. So um, that's what I would say. So again, okay. uh, that's the end of that first topic. And we were just discussing the benefits of the Israeli-American partnership. So okay. again, I'm just looking at my phone here. The next, we're talking about uh, the morality of the Israeli-American relationship. So do you want me to go ahead on that because you started last time or do you want to go? Uh, you can go. I, I mean, would, I just was making sure. I just want to clarify. Yeah. Now, there's American citizens and American government. Yeah. Do you want to talk about all of it or do you want to talk about well, I think the first one was government. We want to talk no, about I mean, America. Answer, I'm, I mean, the question was, it's pretty, I mean, I'm not trying to, the, here's the question. The uh, the morality of the Israeli-American relationship. So the relationship okay. between our two governments, how we work in, in tandem. Okay. And actually, uh, well, I, I, think, I think some of those other questions might touch into that dual loyalty thing later, which we'll discuss. I mean, questions you, you said between citizens oh, and stuff like that. Okay. And that might be more for dual loyalty. So let's just talk about the, uh, the morality of America's partnership with hmm. Israel and their government. Well, I think, I mean, the question becomes really broad. I mean, what's the morality of our relationship with the British government or with the Russian government? I, I mean, I think we need to flesh this out a little bit. The morality, okay, meaning like, um, hmm. I guess I see what you're saying there. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, as an American citizen, so here's a, let me start with well, yeah, a question. Just, just, um, let's just go with it, Arthur. What's the morality? I mean, sorry, we, we, I did, I did <laughs> okay, text you before. Good, I'm glad I can set it up that way. Okay, I think it's totally appropriate, and I think it's beneficial when you have American citizens who, Christians especially, but also Jews, and, you know, even Muslims, you know, I don't see a problem there necessarily. You know, they care about Israel. They want Israel to thrive. They care about Israelis. You know, I'm a Christian. I want everybody to believe in Jesus. You know, um, I think it's appropriate if they want to spend their time, if they want to minister there. This is something interesting that's now coming to mind. Our relationship, people have this idea that, you know, Israel tells us what to do, but I'm thinking it's starting to change. The reason I say this, we all know that a more, I hate that term extreme right, because it's anybody who has common sense. You know, they call us extreme right because you shouldn't mutilate a kid, you know. But you have a much, you have right wing elements within Netanyahu's government that have come into power. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very well aware they wanted to ban evangelism. They call it proselytizing, but the target was the Christian, the Christian movement, the, the gospel. Being yeah. And Netanyahu, he, he tweets out and says, we will not attack the Christian community. And he put it in English. Now, why would he do that? Because Americans are paying attention. It seems to me that we're now telling them what to do to some extent. It's like the tables have now turned. Now, that again, part of that is because, you know, they vote to send $90 million for the Iron Dome. I think that should stop. Um, so, you know, if, that, if that's going to create a pre precarious situation for Christians, yikes. But then again, Naritra Modi kills Christians, you know, his government or the people, he allows people to kill Christians every day and nobody seems to care when India does it. Um, I think it's okay for Americans to be involved with Israel. I think it's okay to spread the gospel. Um, I, I don't see a problem with that. I don't see it in conflict with the uh, Christian revelation. Uh, I don't think that, that they are aiding and abetting a criminal enterprise. I think Israel has a right to exist. Um, the settlers moved in little by little. They improved the, the region. Um, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, he admitted that it was a pretty much a bankrupt, empty backwater until the Jewish settlers started showing up. Of course, you had the you had the Palestinian, the British Palestine mandate that brought in you know all of these British you know common law reforms. That certainly helped too. 
So, you know, if, if we're going to get to the morality issue, Israel's right to exist. Um, Israeli government does bad things. Um, but I think that they are notoriously and unfairly pilloried compared to a lot of the press, which is not pro-Jewish. I find it it's actually pro-Palestinian. Academia is pro-Palestinian. Um, you know, so we're getting a bad rap by and large. And, the, the, you know, Jacob Wall asked the question and I ask it too. If I had a choice, where would I want to live? I'd rather live in Israel. I guess I answered that question. I kind of jumped into a lot of places, but hey, you let me well, talk, yeah, so no, no, go ahead. No, and that was fine. I mean, honestly, on reflection, maybe that was a broader topic. We could have honed it down, but again, this kind of came in. Um, I would say, I guess in regards to morality, I guess I would define as how it reflects uh, America's image in the world and how it makes us, you know, kind of, you know, uh, maybe if it holds up, and I hate kind of doing these things, because again, foreign policy is actually more a pragmatic thing, but again, in America, in modern, yeah. it, you know, right now in America though, they do invoke these protection of our principles and things like that. And actually they're doing it right now to advocate what's going on in Israel. Um, mm -hmm. And for us to maybe ramp up our defense of Israel, potentially, I'm not saying that's what's happening, but you know, there are those who are arguing out there like Lindsey Graham and getting a uh, pretty forceful. Uh, but I would say this, that it's not a good look that America is providing. I think since this uh, foundation of the state of Israel in 1948, it's provided over like $150 billion to the Jewish state. Um, that's more aid than any other country. I think up until basically Afghanistan and probably Ukraine will pass them too. That's received American <laughs> aid and stuff like that. So I'm just saying, I mean, it's, it's a pretty significant amount. Okay. And um, what has that money gone to? It's essentially gone to creating this large open air prison in Gaza, which fermented this conflict we're currently witnessing now. Hmm. And it's led to a state that, I mean, you mentioned earlier they're a democracy. I, I would firmly deny that they are. I mean, um, it was yeah. recently passed in the Israel, they had an amendment to the Israeli constitution and I'm not familiar with how their constitutional amendment process is. Maybe you could tell me, but I'm sure it went through the Knesset and was signed by Benjamin Netanyahu, but it was basically put into law that Israeli is a Jewish ethno state, essentially like that. Israel is a state for the Jewish people. Yes, they have a large Palestinian minority, but that the Jewish people in a sense are the state forming people of Israel. And I would argue too, if you look at the everyday treatment of Palestinians, they have to work through basically, you know, checkpoints to get through place to place. Um, a lot of these people are, you know, essentially subject to uh, their homes being bulldozed at a moment's notice uh, due to claims by settlers. And um, I think all of this reflects badly on the United States and it's, and it doesn't do well with us when we're trying to uh, build relationships, I think in the Islamic world. So well, that's what I'm saying in terms of morality. I, I understand. I, you, I, you know, and again, don't clarify it. Huh? You've helped clarify it. I appreciate it. Yeah, so that. that's, that's, just, okay. that's just my sense of it. You know, and again, we don't have to agree in it. It's a foreign policy issue, so you could say, but I think um, it has blowback because if you look at what, if you accept the official story of 9-11, which we don't have to hash out here, but that, you know, Osama bin Laden, his various manifestos, he described the occupation uh, or American presence of troops in Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and also in Israel. Okay. And, that, and that many of these, um, you know, Islamic jihadists have expressed these same sentiments for decades. So this is something we have to really consider and really look at. Um, we haven't been an evil, an even-handed player in the region. And um, I don't think it, it looks so good when we're backing the, Palis uh, the Israelis so much to the hilt, especially when uh, Palestinians are languishing in uh, refugee camps across the Middle East. And that has a large part I to see. do. Then sure. Let me just make this last point and I'll let you talk because I've kind of expounded on it. But um, sure. I think that has also in large part to do, you know, I think if you're being an honest dealer and I'm not saying you're not, but there is obviously a lot of diplomatic pressure against countries to give citizenship to the Palestinians and they're purposely kept as a stateless people. And um, I think there's a, there's a reason for that. People say, well, Israel, the, the Jews can go there. Uh, Arabs won't make them citizens. Uh, but I, I just don't think that, you know, they shouldn't have to make them citizens. They should be allowed to return homes that they were uh, forcefully, you know, uh, okay. taken from. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Starting with Gaza, um, Israel gave Gaza, gave it away. Yeah. In fact, they ripped Jewish settlers out. I still remember the In pictures the early of 2000s. That. Yeah, I remember. 2005. Yeah. And uh, Ariel Sharon gave away bits and pieces. That's been the, that was the policy of the Israeli government, the Israeli policy, land for peace, land for peace. That has not worked. It never will. That's true, not just in, in that section of the world. That's true anywhere. Um, well, but, well, maybe I gotta, I'll, you have to qualify that because then someone will shout about Ukraine. But my answer is Ukraine made a deal and they didn't keep it. So that's another story. So I don't want to open that up. Um, so they gave Gaza away. And what did the um, what, what did the Islamic militants pushing the Arabs to do? They turned it into a third world hellhole. There was a floral industry. There was a tourist industry. This is something that those 
those Arab and those Islamic militants did. I want to be, it's tough even talking about terms because you have Arab Christians who support Israel, you have Arab Christians who oppose Israel, you have Arab Muslims who love Israel, they serve in the military, and Arab you know, Muslims who hate Israel, they serve in the Knesset, they serve um, on the Supreme Court. And that kind of push, that debunks the idea that it's an apartheid state, it's not an open-air prison. Why is it that Israel has had to engage in these more intense secure protocol, security protocols? Because you've had a first and a second intifada, where you've had innocent civil, civilians being targeted and murdered by these terrorists. And yes, I understand, you can go back to the early 1940s, I watched Exodus, I know that there were Jewish terrorists, but there's a fundamental difference. When, when a Jew goes crazy and kills a couple of people, he's condemned for it. But when, when so-called Palestinians do it, they name streets after them and they throw parties. There is a fundamental difference here and it's not acceptable. And it's not Christian and I will condemn this. It sickened me when I saw it. I saw a Christmas tree in the West Bank and it had pictures of so-called uh, martyrs. These are people who killed innocents and not just Jews. They killed Christians and they killed Muslims. That is not Christ-like. That's not Christian at all. And this idea of an occupation, okay, a lot of people aren't aware of this. I had to be caught up to speed on this. The Jewish settlers before 1948, they were willing to settle for much less. They were willing to take less. They said, we'll take a little bit, not even what the partition was. They were willing to take like a little bit around Jerusalem, a little bit here and a little bit there. And what happened was the Arabs said, no, get the hell out of here, push the Jews into the sea. And you know what? Behind the scenes, they're going to push the Christians next. So there's that. Um, this idea that, you know, Jews came in, they took up the place, and they pushed everyone. I know about the Nakba, but there's a lot of, you know, that's being misunderstood. Everybody was was hurt by that. Um, this idea that Israel is an apartheid state or is a, is a violent, you know, quasi-Nazi state is nonsensical. Why did those protections exist? Why did they have to build a, they have a security fence and then part of it is a wall. Why? Because of the ongoing terrorist attacks. That's why they have to do it. And remember, everybody gets killed. And here's the last thing. You mentioned about um, settlements being bulldozed. First of all, remember, Jews were ripped out of settlements in Gaza. And look what happened. Second of all, there's recent reports. If Israelis have gone too far, the government has actually broken those down. When, when, when you had our Arabs complain in the, Pal in the so-called Palestinian territories, they have been taken down too. So there has been some equity. So that's just not true. Well, you know, the whole question, first, just go on the immediacy of what you just brought up on settlers and the relationship with the government. This is a very complicated question. You know, you have uh, basically Netanyahu's had to make concessions to these more far right politicians like Itamar Ben Gavir, who is very pro settler. And I'd say Netanyahu's more pro settler. He's just more optical about it, I guess you could say. So um, that's not a sure. monolithic position, um, certainly in the current rolling coalition of Israel and, and their degrees of how much they support the settlers. And I'm sure that some of their, um, you know, resistance to settlements is also due to the fact that America's official position, I believe, is still that Israel can't have any further settlements in these places. So I think obviously I think we need to get out of that business. I think we need to stop telling other countries. And you know, that, that gets us yeah. out of Ukraine. Why are we- But, but, but aside, from, aside from that, I'm just uh, bringing on that. I mean, um, back earlier to the, what you brought up about Gaza and how, you know, the Arabs just turned it into a shithole, I guess, after uh, the, uh, you know, Palestinians or after uh, the Jews left. Well, first off, and I just want to mention too, you mentioned the first and second intifada. Those happened prior um, to the Palestinian uh, depart or to the Jewish settlers being taken out of there by the government in 2005. They sure did. So I'm just, no, and and I, I'm just bringing it up because it's like, uh, I think that's a point there. It's like you said, land for peace. And it was like, that was the logic. It's not like they just did it in a vacuum. It's like, okay, we've had these huge intifadas and it's like, let's try it out. And also let me just, um, and I'm not saying it worked and, be, and I've heard that argument before. I'm just saying it wasn't like, I just want to be clear. It's not like the Israelis just gave them land. It was like, okay, it was strategic. It was part of the Oslo Accords. These things went on. Um, anyways, I just want to mention though too, Gaza also, I mean, it's not really, Again, when you said it's it's been degraded so much and it's lost its floral industry and things like that, I mean, news has just come out that Israel's planning on shutting down its energy grid. So how can they create a functioning economy if their their sworn enemies have control mm -hmm. to their energy grids? Every time there's supplies or anything that's tried to be brought into Gaza, you have to worry about like the ID. I mean, this has been I'm sure you've heard about national stories about flotillas. I believe there was a big kerfuffle, and you could quote. Uh, I think you might be familiar with this with Turkey or the Red Crescent, a Red Crescent ship coming from Turkey, where um, Israeli soldiers, and I can send you the uh, text on this afterward, um, had like a confrontation with these uh, with these 
uh, these volunteer organizations on these supplies meant to go to Gaza. So the point I'm making is, is like, they really have no chance at having a fair economy or I mean, a, a okay. thriving economy or anything like that, because Israel totally controls movement in and out. They control their energy. They control everything. And I think um, just back on the question of morality, I guess someone mentioned in a good point that, you know, and I do agree because I'm a foreign policy realist. Uh, you know, decisions aren't based on morality and foreign policy. It's based on national interest. So I agree. But I would say, I guess, how does it, how does America's relationship in uh, the international world with Israel affect its image in a neutral or in a positive or negative way? And I guess that could have been the question. I'm not trying to change it, but that could have been it. That's fine. And I guess that's what okay. I'm trying to answer. Go ahead. Regarding Gaza, I mean, the situation is if, if the individuals, you know, again, I hate the term Palestinian that was imposed. It was never a natural term. I'm, ugh, this is part of our problem. The, the language has gotten so frayed. Palestinian comes from Philistine. That's about it. Not story. Cool. I know. I'll let you, you know it. it. Sure. Yeah. sure. So, but we got to work with what we got. You know, I don't. Um, so it's like if, if the individuals in these territories are committed to a stable and democratic regime, you know, and not violating other people's natural rights, then that's then then Israel can take hands off, but they can't do that because look what happened in Hamas. Look, you look at what happened in Gaza. You look what happened in the PLO. They elected Hamas. They used their democratic freedoms to elect terrorism, and this terrorism, it's in their charter: destroy Israel, wipe them off the face of the earth. And so, if I'm a country living next door to this country that their whole charter is determined to wipe me out, I'm going to be keeping my hand on things so that they don't get away with it. Now, the the, the energy being shut down, that's being done now because you've had whole, so many of them paratroop in and shooting and well, killing that, innocent civilians. That, and not that's killing Jews, that they're killing Germans, they're killing Americans. That's happening but, frequently. But, it, no, 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 it, it has happened. I mean, that's been one of the complaints. They're like, well, we have no access to running water and a consistent they, energy over here. That's the fault of the leadership in these well, regions. They elect terrorists that put kids on the firing line to be shot rather than putting the needs of their people first. This is what's going on over and over again. Mm -hmm. They, Golda Meir, God forbid, yes, I'm quoting her, and so that's going to be biased of a sort, but it really does come down to this. You've got these so-called Palestinians. They love death more than the Jews love life. And that's and they're indoctrinated with it. And you know what? And American money is paying for it. And we should be pissed about that too. We both agree. No more money to foreign governments. I couldn't no, agree I more. Mean, yeah, we, we can that agree on that. But I think, uh, but I think, I think we can also we can't even defend our own border. But yeah. that I'm changing the subject a little. No, no, you're fine. So, so I, guess, I guess just to kind of wrap up this topic and sure. just kind of keep it on point. And um, yep. what would you say? I, I mentioned earlier the question was, what is the morality of the Israeli-American relationship? I guess fine tuning it as we've done in the course of this. And you could choose if you'd like to go with this uh, prompt and just to wrap it up. What is the Ben or how is uh, America's relationship with Israel affected its image in the world? Has it been positive or negative? And I guess um, if that's the same way you feel like or just wow. wrap, wrap, let's wrap this one up. Okay, okay. just if we're going to talk about image. Okay. First of all, I don't think we should really care what our image is to the rest of the world. we got to care about truth and error or about interest. That was Arthur Mechadumian who, who had mentioned that comment. Um, I, I think that it's still it still remains in our strategic interest. This is a nation that we have kinship with because they're a fledgling democracy. Well, they're a real democracy. We're a constitutional republic. We are using that jargon. That frustrates me. Um, they're, a stable re they're a stable region. They are a strategic partner. Um, but it needs to be one of, if you want tanks, you pay for it rather than just give them money. Um, that should be with every country. I'll keep harping on that issue. Um, we just, just can't, I mean, Jeez, I mean, our, we don't even secure our own damn border. Here, let's have some fun. I will give $3 billion a year to Israel if they will build our wall, because they're really good at building walls. So uh, let's have some fun. I think Ann Coulter came up with that. Um, but at any rate, um, it's a net positive. That country needs to exist. It needs to thrive. Um, this is a country that we should support. Um, it doesn't mean that we pay for everything. It doesn't mean we can't criticize them. If they want to put tariffs on our stuff, we have a right to challenge that. I hope that I've explained the relationship. Okay. Okay. Well, and again, um, just to kind of finish up, uh, how it affects, how it kind of affects America's international prestige and our view in the world and uh, the morality of it, and kind of also tying in interest. It makes America a target of blowback and a target of oh. these Islamic radicals. That's okay. what I'm, that's my argument. Can I respond to that? I'll let you finish, as, but I'll respond to that. Yeah, as been as been evidenced uh, through manifestos okay. and kind of the stated goals and ambitions of mm. many of these groups over the centuries and many of these individuals, or not over the centuries, sorry, over the decades recently okay. that have participated in these um, attacks. So I would say that um, that that's been kind of the main motivation there. America's relationship it really doesn't help us and. Um, 
just okay. to kind of also make a final point on you know america if you look at how it makes us look in the middle east and we're trying to have these relationships with, with countries and stuff like that um we have to really assess you know does it look good that we're arming a country israel with apache helicopters weapons all these different uh you know weapons and heavy you know heavy equipment uh mm -hmm. running and things like that and going against literally i mean if you see some of these uh villages and stuff they're going against going against like palestinian toddlers armed with stones and that's like the reality you know what i mean it's like the people okay. in gaza and these other places really have no and i'll just finish and i'll let you go have no means of fighting back um you know it's i'm actually shocked they were able to get so much weapons in here um, and, and kind of do the fighting they have been able to do, but um, considering you look at what they've had to deal with before. But uh, just overall, I, I would say that, like I said, it's a detriment to America's uh, relationship with countries in the Middle East, and it makes us a target of that region's ire, which has led to terrorist attacks in the United States, terrorist attacks in Europe. It doesn't make us safe. It threatens our national security. And um, I believe we do have, just to end on this, I believe we do have some kind of defensive alliance with Israel, which I think is totally unnecessary. I don't believe in entangling alliances. And um, I think that also threatens our national security, as we can see now, because you have American carriers moving into the Eastern Mediterranean. So okay. um, I'll let you kind of rebut that, and then we'll move on to the next topic. Okay, so first of all, you know, th th this idea that the that Hamas is defenseless is not true. I mean, they had they had clear weapons of war that they're using on the the population. They've been doing this a number of times. They fire rockets into the into the country, so they do have the weapons. They're getting them from Iran. They're getting them from Hezbollah. They're getting them from other Islamic interests in the region. Um, when you talk about the kids being targeted, again, this is this is the perverse propaganda that is pervasive in the Middle East that makes um, Israel look bad. It makes it. There have been a number of times when they've gone after Palestinian terrorists, and they they do strategic. Uh, Natan Sharansky talked about this in his book, uh, the case for um, case for democracy, not the case for Israel. By the way, he opposed Bush's plans. He didn't like the idea of everybody voting is not democracy. You have to have other values in place. He even left, and he left um, the Sharon government when they gave up Gaza. By the way. So, I mean, he was more isolationist. He was not this warmonger that people painted about to be. Um, you know, so, and th this idea that we're, you know, you've got defenseless, you know, you've got Israelis that are defenseless that are getting killed. Um, and the palace, you got these Hamas, they put the kids in the firing lines and have them get shot. Um, there was a video that was recently released. This was during um, a previous conflict a couple of years prior where they gave the impression that um, Israeli soldiers had attacked a defenseless Palestinian, but all three of them were Palestinians and two of them were actors dressed up as Israeli soldiers. So there's a lot of that media game. They have lost one, they've had one setback after another, so they're playing the, the law, they're playing the media game to demonize Israel. That's what's going on. Okay. I, no, and then just, I, and, I'll let you take the floor here, and I'll let you take the floor here again, just to wrap this up. Because so, I think I missed something. Um, Thing that you said because we switched the ch subject like our perception before the world oh please let me get to this no, you're fine. okay um they're attacking us because we've caused all this trouble here's the thing i mean islam is motivated by a globalist um what's the uh i can't think of the you know, there's a fancy you know not scatological but there's an ontolo not ontological but there's a term for there is a worldview where the whole world will be, under, will be under Islam. So even if America wasn't doing stuff with Israel or involved in Iraq, involved in everywhere else, they would still come after us. Um, I, I just don't find that persuasive. Um, they they want they're invading Europe as we speak. I mean, mm -hmm. There's a lot more at stake than just Osama bin Laden doesn't like that we dropped bombs or that our government dropped bombs on Iraq or um, Syria. Um, well. Uh, again and on the migration to Europe, there's actually a lot of NGOs involved with that that are Jewish, like Israel and George Soros' Open Society Foundation. But I think that's getting off topic. And I, and I don't want to go. And I don't go ahead. Yeah, and I don't want to get off topic. So just to, I'll let you, actually, I want to let you finish. I kind of stated my belief uh, in how it affects us in international terms, how it kind of provides blowback on us. Do you just want to summarize your position uh, one last yeah. time? Or do you believe you have? Because there's a lot to get. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that, I think we would suffer, you know, considerable blowback from Islamic elements, regardless of our relationship with Israel, um, because they have a they have an is they have an Islamic totalitarian vision. That's what you know. These countries, Iran's part of that. Al Qaeda is part of that. And you know, Al Qaeda and Iran, there's two different Islamic sects that fight with each other too. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think that you know. Western Europe and even Eastern Europe has a positive relationship with Israel, so it's actually strengthened our hand. You have a number of, after Trump moved the embassy, uh, you had other countries.
countries that did the same thing. Um, you have Viktor Orban. We love him. He's a great populist, and he loves, you know, he has a strong relationship with Israel. I, I don't think he sends them money. I don't know. I could be wrong. <laughs> I don't um, think, I mean, Alvin, they, they, they could. They could for uh, Holocaust charges or uh, Holocaust yeah, reparations. And I, and I think I'm not that's sure. up. They extort a lot wrong. of countries with that, but go well, ahead. Extortion, well, you know, okay, that's a, there goes I mean, with the go, talk to, go talk to the people of Poland. That's how they feel about it, but go and, ahead. And they're going after Germany because they're asking reparations from Germany. So yeah. that, that, you know, this is a, the, the world needs the gospel. If you don't have the gospel, you're always playing the game of you owe me. It'll never stop. But at any rate, um, last but not least, our prestige is enhanced because of our relationship with Israel. We have positive relationships with Western countries, African countries, you know, South American countries, unless they're communistic, like Venezuela, they expelled all their Jews and they got rid of the Israeli diplomat. But that gets into question three. Boom, okay. I, there. I think I answered All right, this. awesome. No, no. Thank you. And thank you, Arthur. Um, so the next topic, um, dual loyalty, fact or fiction. Um, I'm going to explain kinda... what that is. I'm going to shut up and let you talk. What is that? Okay. Yeah, no, no. I'm going to get into it. So what I'm asserting is earlier, and I think we were trying to touch on this um, at multiple points at the benefits of an Israeli-American partnership when you were mentioning like the Zionist lobby. So I got to clarify the terms on this dual loyalty fact or fiction what i'm saying is is there a noticeable trend of dual loyalties in the united states among people prominent as american jews uh, american jewish political leaders who serve in office and things like that and i and i'm asserting that i believe there is and i think um one of the most obvious um examples of that and earlier you were testing and i'm just speaking now and feel free to debunk it but um earlier you were testing that there's no zionist lobby and i was trying to no 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 uh, that's no, you're why, no, no, I'm just, I'm, I didn't clarify. So I'll, I'll clarify no, that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. You have it on film. I'm not saying you're, you. You corrected yourself and clarified for people. Okay, who are so watching. you can't say that. You got to go with my correction, which is, okay. Let's that clarify this. Is minimal, correct. That's yeah. what you're stating. Yeah, that they're not okay. pulling this yeah, train okay. directly. Yeah, you're saying there, there are people who are Zionists who want Zionist outcomes. Every yeah. So, wants so dual loyalty, loyalty, like I said, dual loyalty. These people are Zionists, or they're. Uh, Jewish ethno nationalist, which is what yeah. Zionism is, it's Jewish ethno nationalism. Um, I would argue that that is evident okay. in the conflict in Ukraine. If you look at the people who are running point on the conflict in Ukraine, it's people like Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, it's people like Victoria Nuland. Um, in Ukraine, the people that are kind of in charge too, that have been overseeing the country since the Maidan, have all been overwhelmingly Jewish. And this has been a uh, American State Department project with people like Victoria Nuland. She had that famous phone call where they were uh, gonna choose who the leader of the country was with another American bureaucrat. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And they were gonna choose uh, Arsene Yatsen You can look that up, I'll send you the link on it. Uh, who was another politician at the time. But the point is, if you look at uh, the Maidan, which was a American coordinated color revolution uh, by essentially uh, Jewish neoconservatives and Jewish Zionists in America's State Department and in America's foreign policy establishment, all okay. of the leaders of Ukraine since then have been uh, of partial ethnic Jewish ancestry or ethnic Jews. Uh, Petro Poroshenko had a Jewish father. Again, that's a very tightly kept secret. He kept that very low key on the campaign. Trail. Zelensky is Jewish. Don't forget Zelensky, Zelensky is Jewish and actually, um, Ukraine with Israel was the in 2019 was the only country with two Jewish heads of state, uh, being Volodymyr Groisman and Volodymyr Zelensky, who was the prime minister, and president, respectively. And you can look that up. But the point is that the question of dual loyalty, um, I think it's evident in the current Ukraine war uh, with all these uh, various um, people whose family were Eastern European Jews. Um, I think having this kind of long held ethnic animus against the Slavs of Eastern Europe, and that's just my personal contention. Um, I'd also say, too, that um, if you look at uh, what's been going on in American politics, like um, a great example of this too, would be the HB 269 in Florida. And you're a, you're a DeSantis supporter, aren't you? I don't want to put you on the spot. Yes. Okay, so and there's yes, wrong thank you for coming. I'm a Trump supporter, so I mean, we're, we're talking it out. Um, but I just wanted to say, um, you know, if you look at what Ron DeSantis bit, did with HB 269, and I think you're familiar with carrying off this, and we can probably discuss it. HB okay. 269, and for those who don't know, is essentially a hate speech law that was, in my opinion, yep. it's a hate speech law passed in the state of Florida, which Ron DeSantis actually signed in Israel Israel after having dinner with yes. uh, Miriam Adelson and I believe Bernard Marcus too, who's one of the uh, co CEOs of uh, the Home Depot conglomerate, along with Arthur Blank, former owner of the Atlanta Falcons. It might okay. have been Bernie Marcus, but I know for sure Miriam Adelson that was there, along with other prominent Jewish billionaires from America. He's. I'm not mocking you. A lot of Jews were there. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no. You're fine, but yeah, no. 
And uh, HB 269 was signed shortly after he was there. The Republicans sponsored mm -hmm. it. And essentially, it was brought up by Jewish ethnic activists to counter what were essentially what they deemed anti-Semitic um, events going on in Florida with banner drops and pamphleting and leafleting and things like that, which okay. are all protected forms of speech under the Constitution. It doesn't say the First Amendment up until Jewish sentiments are offended or the First Amendment up until you know, the ADL is upset. You know, it's basically the First Amendment. We have a standard here. It's known as imminent violence. It was uh, established in a case, I believe, called Brandenburg versus Ohio. Tucker Carlson's talked about it. I could send you- And I just want to put it. a quick shout out. The ADL yeah. sucks. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. But um, so on that note, I would just say that um, I think dual loyalty is evident. You see it through okay. America's foreign policy mechanisms. Um, in the mm. current Ukraine war, I would say also in our previous wars, uh, other Jewish neocons were very prominent running point on that. And some of them still like, you know, Bill Crystal, uh, Max Boot, others are very prominent in American political life. They're kind of being rehabbed. Sure. And um, I would also say that, you know, uh, the dual loyalty is also evident with the large Americans. I mean, you contend that they have limited influence, but I would say that it's there is a labyrinthine network of endless Jewish NGOs and endless Zionist NGOs that con constantly advocate and influence our politicians. And this is evident if you look at, for example, too, just to finish on this, what's what with what's been going on with Elon Musk. Elon Musk is the wealthiest man in the planet. He uh, uh, bought Twitter for $44 uh, billion. The ADL, which you mentioned, sucked, which I agree, devalued the platform. And then he has to go on Twitter spaces and basically be talked down to by rabbis and uh, other people of the like. And, I, and I, if that's not a demonstration that the wealthiest man in America has to mm -hmm. be dressed down um, on his own platform um, of power and of loyalty, I think... Um, I think I, I can't really think of anything else. So I'll, I'll wrap up that. Okay. That's my that's my assertion that um, dual loyalty in America is uh, I think it's evident. It's easy to track. And um, I think it's something it's a real conversation we have to have because um, just to end it too, there are many ethnic lobbies in this country. Uh, Am I going to get a chance to respond? Because there's a lot of issues to no, respond to. Yeah. And I'll just say there's many ethnic lobbies in this country. You know, you okay. You said to, you're you know, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. See, go ahead. Go ahead. The reason go ahead. I have to be a little militant is that there's a lot of things to respond yeah, go to. Ahead. Go ahead. Arthur. Go okay. Ahead. Shoot. I'm going to start with a question now. I'm just looking for a, a basic answer. Yeah. Um, do you think that there's something like in the genetics of an individual of Jewish descent that induces them to certain behaviors, certain modes of thinking? Is that your argument? I don't know. Well, I mean, it's it's interesting because there's yes, people no. who... Let's no, I'm, I'm, I'm answering your question. question. I'm answering your question. You know, there's uh, people like Kevin McDonald who have talked about maybe, you know, Jewish ethnicism. Oh, yes. Yeah, the I know, and critique, I, I, correct? Yeah, okay, so now it's my turn now. Okay, so here we go. The culture of critique has been uh, debunked in another cases. I'll give you one example. Okay. So, Mr. Mr. McDonald, oh, can I share a story? Go can ahead. I share a story? I'll be go very ahead. quick. Shoot. You're going to love this story. I Shoot. love sharing this story. Go ahead. I'm a Cal State alumnus, and I was on campus when uh, Kevin McDonald was there. That was his last two years. I got a teaching credential. It was my secondary credential. I can teach six, uh, single subjects, sixth grade through 12th. My credential advisor was Jewish. Her name was Arlene Lazarowitz. Now, she was interviewed by the local newspaper about Mr. McDonald and his very controversial research. You know, Jews have this evolutionary psychology and they promote their own interests at the expense of the home countries or the countries they move to. And you know what she said? She said, I defend his academic freedom 100%. I don't think you should silence him. I think you should challenge him. Right away, her response debunked his thesis. But that's not enough. You're right. That's one example. The second one, he asserts in his book, well, the, the Polish government, it was under a dictatorship before, um, before Hitler took over. Yeah, Josef Pilsdowski. Yes. And the, the, the argument was that they hired Jews to be police officers because they were a nation within a nation, right? And so they'd have no problem beating up other Polish people. That's just not true. The statistics bear out that they were actually the Jews were the most victimized by police brutality in the Polish regime. So that's another example that's debunked. There are other logical problems. Um, he doesn't so who, wait, where is your statistics from? Like, who debunked it? Uh, you keep saying they're debunked. Like, who debunked the Polish uh, assertions yeah. that the Jews were policemen? The name I don't. Shoot, I don't remember the name, but if you, you Google it, I'll, if I can find the article, I'll send yeah, it to you. I know I say it on my. But, so, but you don't. So, you don't I'm not done yet. Right? Okay, remember, you, okay. you spoke at the bank. Okay, so now we have to also continue. Oh, gosh. Um, you, there, to me, there's an even bigger issue. The Jews started communism. You know, that's one of the other assertions that's part of KMAX thesis. But here's the problem with that. 
Rosa Luxemburg, sure, she was Jewish, but it was Gentile money that propped her up. Karl Marx, that's, this guy's a Jew. Oh my gosh, it's the Jews' fault. He stole his ideas mostly from French physiocrats. One of them was Henri de saint simon That guy was talking about collectivization, you know, collective ownership of property, destroying the family. And of course, you're a brilliant guy. Who was the guy? So as Marx would say, he turned the dialectic on its head. But who started the dialectic? Hegel. Hegel. That guy's about as wasp as it gets. Most of these communistic ideas were not of Jewish origin. Not only that, but even in this country, now you guys are gonna snicker, so let me get past the first ones. People will mention Dennis Prager and, and uh, Ben Shapiro. They're Jewish and they're not communistic, and, but people debunk and they shame them and say, these guys are you know nation within a nation types. I don't find that persuasive. I, ben Shapiro still lives in America. This guy has said, I don't want money going to Israel. Yes, he supported the war in Iraq, he was wrong. You got Jacob Wall, who's probably more America first than I'll ever be. Um, you've got Stephen Miller, a Jew, who has sued on behalf of non-Jewish um, non whites who are, per who are discriminated against. America First Legal has been fighting and winning cases for non-Jewish, okay, for Gentile. I hate, I hate the term white. I go back to your campaign. I'm sick of hyphenated Americans. We're Americans. I'm not a white American. I really loathe that. I don't like calling people black. I hate that, but we're stuck, just like with the whole Palestinian issue. McDonald's thesis um, has been debunked. You can look at the present day. Who, who You've got more debunked it, though. I got to find that story. But I, the research I read there, and I give you an example in his own book. I'm showing you that that was like thrown out. It was that the data is off. He he distorts the data. He doesn't consider counter arguments, which I've just given to you. Oh, let me ask you this question. Okay. The Jew Jewish question. It, it was a book. Who wrote that book? I'm not familiar with who wrote the book. Karl Marx. Mm, interesting. A Jew wrote a book mm -hmm. bashing other Jews. This this whole thesis about Jews promoting themselves. And even in Washington, for crying out loud, you have Jews who are Republicans. You have Jews who are Democrats. You have Dove Heiken, a Democrat who absolutely loathes the, the whole Moss caucus. He's supporting Republicans. He's supporting Trump. My point is, you have Jews of different political parties, of different political interests. They don't all agree on the same things. They're undermining their, their, their different interests. They're not the same. And this, um, Steve Pinker offered some of these, fund if you want to source, Steve Pinker, um, he offered some fundamental problems with the culture of critique because, and I, this is ultimately why I really wanted to have this discussion. And I am not trying to, I need to share this with the general audience here. Um, okay, you can see my computer. Uh, okay, because you post, this is your Instagram, so it's public. Yeah. Okay. And you've got this. Yeah, and, that's, my, that's mine right there. And, and you know what? I'm sorry. The Jews don't control the media. They don't. If oh. they do, they're not doing a very good job. Mm -hmm. um, Harvey Weinstein's in jail. Um, the guy who owned the New York Times, which was a huge influential newspaper, that was a guy named Hugo Slim. He's a Mexican of Arab descent, not Jewish. Um, you, you guys will mention um, Rupert Murdoch because there was a picture of him with a rabbi. The guy's as Anglo-Saxon Protestant as it gets. The guy's not a Jew. Just because he's pro-Israel doesn't make him Jewish. This is wrong, dude. This is just not true. Well, the, New York, the New York Times actually, uh, Carlos Slim's no longer the majority owner Thank of the God. New York Times. That, God, I, mean, I read that in the book, too. too. Even if but he, Summer he, Redstone. He's no longer, Summer he's Redstone no longer the majority okay, owner. Okay, but Summer I, Redstone. So what is so I've got to finish this. I've got to finish. Summer Redstone was the head of Viacom, which was the head of CBS. So a big media player, correct, Amundo? Uh -huh. Jew. You, you wouldn't know because Redstone isn't Jewish. Summer isn't Jewish, but he was of Jewish descent. He lost his media empire. No, I'm sorry, folks. The Jews don't control the media because the media is so pro-Palestinian. The Jews did not control Hollywood. Hollywood isn't even worth controlling anymore. Uh -huh. I mean, and wars for Israel. You're talking about whether it's the, the clear sheet document, whatever it is. The, the key the clean break memo. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. It was Dick Cheney, Condoleezza Rice, and George W. Bush. Mm. They're not Jews. I'm sorry, okay. about, but the Jews don't run everything. In fact, and if they were, they're doing a pretty shitty job. I'm being a little, you know, it, it's just not there. So this and this and all of that is what feeds into the whole dual loyalty question. Um, my boss is an Orthodox Jew, Brian Kamaker, and oh, uh, he doesn't even go to most of the he doesn't even go to most of the synagogues anymore. This guy makes Pat Buchanan look like a liberal. 
um, Brian was opposed to abortion, like no exceptions. And I was an exceptions guy, for example. He was a big fan of Pat Buchanan. He absolutely opposed the war in Iraq. Uh, one of these days, you got to talk to Brian. He actually schooled me on Iraq. He uh -huh. schooled me on it because I was like, so remember, you got Brian Kamaker, and he's Jewish, and this guy hated Bill Crystal's policies. So, I, I mean, this whole nation within a nation, culture of critique the jews fall it's nonsense it's okay, just so... nonsense. But you can believe it I, I can't help you if you want to believe it mm -hmm. but no sorry folks it, stop blaming the jews it ain't their fault and stop blaming the white guy how about we start talking about that for once you know what was it that black supremacist kill the boar why aren't we talking about that you know or the christians being killed in india why aren't we talking about that i just find that interesting anyway can so I, I kind of went on a rant there, but this no, is no, 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 I, what I really wanted to address. The Jewish question, I've answered it. There ain't no Jewish question. It's really an individual question. Oh, I love that. Oh, I just love that question. Am I Jewish? No. I've got relatives all over. I've got three of my eight great grandparents. Three of them are I of Irish descent. Two of them are of Czech descent. One of them was Scottish. Uh, and I'm sure, and, and I've got some French Canadian behind me. I just no. find that fascinating. You must be Jewish. No, I believe in the truth. Okay. That's what it's about. There, I went on a, oh. I guess you can spin it or have fun with it. I'm, I'm happy. I, I, I'm glad I could just, come on guys. Let's, let's well, cut the comedy here. Okay. Can I, are you, are you done? Cause I let you, you no, I'm, I'm just, I'm saying, I'll let you, I wanted to let you get it out. Cause I, I did speak earlier initially at the start. So at the Go start ahead. of all this, we're talking about dual loyalty, fact or fiction. <laughs> Um, I stated that I believe dual loyalty is evident um, in a variety of ways, whether it's through uh, foreign policy, it's through uh, sympathies to Israel and our citizenry, it's through a whole mm -hmm. host of things. Arthur is alleging that... Um, I'm not alleging, I'm asserting it. I prove it. You're proving it. Okay, so um, I just want to say first on the culture of critique, you mentioned you, you gave anecdotal yep. evidence that you had a credential advisor who is Jewish that uh -huh. protected Kevin Mc or a Asserted that she wanted Kevin McDonald to have academic freedom. So that's the absolutely. One. He ne she never but signed. That, so that's. No, oh, can I finish? Can I just say? So that, that was just, one. That was one Jewish professor. I gave you plenty of other. All the other in the face of all the other uh, people at the ADL, all these other organizations, pro-Jewish organizations, who essentially okay. canceled them and ran him out of his career at Cal State in the Cal State system. So I'm just, I'm gonna finish that. That's the first part. Okay. Um, and I just, and I just wanted to bring that up because I, and, and you mentioned too, because uh, you brought it in, uh, you, you sidetracked then into uh, how uh, polls would use Jewish police officers and there was no, no didn't. evidence that they were in that they were most victimized, but who, like, who was the commission or what, what was the source? I mean, I'm not, you're, okay. just, you're just throwing it out. I, I can find it. Some okay. sources. You should look this up. Sure. You should look up Sever Plocker and Stalin's Jews. If we're going to talk about sure. historical Jewry and police and police oh, uh, oh. and policing in Eastern Europe, he's going to stop there. You know, Lenin is, was Jewish too. You know that, right? Who? Lenin was Jewish. You know that, right? Well, he was like a par partial Jewish ancestry. He didn't partial Jewish. Didn't know that he was Jewish. But so how can, can I finish? Advocating on pack of Arthur. Jewish interests, he didn't even know. Arthur, can I just finish, please? I, I'm asking with respect. So I'm just saying, so you mentioned earlier that uh, you, you cited okay. something specifically that the Polish government under Pilsdusky used police officers or the di or the government prior to World War II used police officers um, in Poland that were overwhelmingly Jewish. And you said there was a source that debunked that and that they were the most victimized. Um, you haven't been able to give me that source yet. I'll, I'll wait if you provide oh, it to me. If we're gonna if play you that game, to me well, afterward, I'll... if you provide it to me afterward, I'll be glad to share it and I'll say I was wrong. But um, I'll give you some points of contact. Sever Plocker and Stalin's Jews, which is an article on Ynet News from around 2006, 2005. You go ahead, look it up right now. Se uh, Stalin's Jews by Sever Plocker. He points out that 40% of the Soviet secret police, the people who were responsible for land requisitions, for murdering people and things of that nature, all throughout the Soviet Union, some of the most brutal atrocities, people like Lazar Kaganovich, Genrik Yagoda, people involved with the Holodomor, 40% of the people in the Cheka, I believe it was the Cheka or it would have been the NKVD, but I believe it was the Cheka at the time, were Jewish. And he also mentions Genrik Yagoda and Lazar Kaganovich, like I mentioned earlier. Um, I know from personal experience living in Hungary, um, there was a woman, actually, I'll give you another article. Her name is Joanna Wilson, or Joanna Granville. She worked at the Wilson Center, and it's called uh, Hungary, uh, Hungary Reconsidered, or Hungary 1956 Reconsidered, Why Poland, or Why Hungary and Not Poland. And we're talking again on this broader topic. You mentioned that 
there's no evidence of uh, Jews being involved in policing in, in Eastern Europe during this, the interwar period. But I'm, um, or in okay, Poland, I'll in to that Poland later. you said that, in okay. Poland you said that, but I'm just bringing up points of contact to refute it. Because um, in Hungary, like I mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. Bella Kuhn, who led the 1919 Hungarian communist uh, dictatorship short-lived, was Jewish. Um, Gerge Lukács, who was the Hungarian cultural commissioner during that time, and was an associate of the Frankfurt School, also Jewish. Many of the people in the Frankfurt School is also Jewish, but that's aside from the question of dual loyalty we're talking about here. Um, and, um, you know, there's many elements where Jews were involved with communist secret police organizations and policing organizations and treated people brutally in that part of the world. But again, that's getting away from dual loyalty. I just wanted to bring that up because you were kind of bringing up a lot of points of contact. So I, I was, because I, I think, think that's the real I don't issue. Think, I don't think, in my opinion, in my opinion, and I say this with due respect, and you can send me sources. I do, and because you said you proved there wasn't, I don't think you sufficiently disproved anything Kevin McDonald said. I don't think you successfully showed anything about there being a lack of uh, Jews being involved. I would. I don't think there was any Jews actually probably involved in the Pills Dusky government, anyways. I mean, hmm. to be honest, if I had to, or at least in the okay. policing, I wouldn't be surprised because it was a highly nationalist government. And that's kind of a contentious thing. We could debate that. I, I'm not an expert on uh, the Pills Dusky government, but that's a whole other thing. And okay. um, anyways, though, to get back to it, I mean, I think it's uh, my whole thing and my whole point. What I've said is that um, dual loyalty in America, like I mentioned, we there's no other group that essentially meets with a sitting governor of the United States, a sitting highest executive in oh, the state, the in a foreign, That's in right. a foreign country, and has him sign legislation which mm -hmm. limits the First Amendment for US citizens. Now that's power, and that shows that these people aren't committed, and again, not all of them, there's many Jews who have spoken oh, out sure. verbally against this stuff, like Norman Finkelstein and others. Um, and I think, and I think they've done great work, but, um, you know, ultimately we can't, um, I think overlook this. And like I was trying to mention earlier, cause I dish gabbed and I was talking a lot and I wanted to let you get in. There are tons of ethnic lobbies in America. I will assert that too. And I'm sure you could agree. There's, there's plenty that, uh, influence our affairs. I mean, if you're familiar with the Yugoslavia war from the 1990s, there emerged a powerful Albanian lobby in America. And people might laugh at that and be like, what are you serious? But no, that, that How about really happened. Cutter? So, Cutter is a huge lobby, yeah, and nobody Gulf talks about Cutter. states. The Gulf states, Turkey has a powerful huge lobby here. Um, thank, go you ahead. For, thank you for reminding me about the DeSantis situation. Okay, so what happened with that? Okay, it's mostly Jews who are being targeted with this anti-Semitic, you know, riffraff, trash, pamphleting, whatever. Uh, I can't remember. The, it's the state senator or he's a state assemblyman from Florida. He's in Melbourne Beach. Oh man, fine, Randy, fine. Why do I know about this guy? Because he was introducing a bill to ban sex mutilation of minors. So we, I work with a lot of legislators throughout the country. I call his office, et cetera. So the fact is, Jews are getting targeted with a lot of this, you know, anti-Semitic stuff. We're going to kill you. We're going to take you down, whatever. What this law does, what, it, what, the, the, what the DeSantis 269, what it does is that you can't, it's a trespass issue. You can't put it on private property. And it, it actually has extensive protections. I would not want a satanic temple broadcasting by light a pentagram on a church that's a nuisance issue that's the idea now we can argue about the severity of the punishment and you can say well look it's the jews doing it well there's a lot of jews in florida and a lot of them are getting targeted so it's understandable that they don't want to be targeted it doesn't infringe on the first amendment because it's on private property now if you're on public property and if you want to read from the culture of critique you're allowed to do that in fact i don't know if you i know you saw this a lot of us did laura loomer confronted a bunch of nazis uh -huh. that were on a thoroughfare or they were over a freeway highway whatever and and they were all biden supporters too interestingly enough actually there's no surprise really um they're they're allowed to do that nobody told them they could and do it it's a nuisance issue it's a private property issue that's what that law does and brandenburg versus ohio doesn't it doesn't allow me for example i can't barge into your house and take out a megaphone and scream it's your property i'm not allowed to do that um what the bill does that it, it, it's i'm sorry I, you let me no, I'm letting, I don't know, I'm letting you speak i'm letting you go yeah. right there. it's an open forum. so that's the that's argument the there um and so there he was in israel and he was signing off on it uh i i i don't find it persuasive i we <sighs> The idea that politicians don't um, reach out or work with ethnic groups. Here in California, we have a large Armenian population. Um, we have congressmen who have gone to Armenia. We have congressmen that have lobbied um, the let Adam Schiff. Uh, sorry, but there it is. 
Adam Schiff, for example, they were there. They pushed, they pushed resolutions demanding that Turkey admit that they, you know, committed genocide against or they perpetrated a genocide against Armenians. So this idea that, oh, it's only the Jews who are able to twist politicians to do stuff for them. That's ridiculous. You have um, here in, in Torrance, we have the second largest Japanese American population. That's just a fact. Um, we have some Asian Americans on our city council. And you know what? I'm, I'm of a difference of opinion. I don't want Asian American month. I don't want Black History Month. I definitely don't want a White History Month or Italian American Month. I, I'm with you. No more hyphenated Americans. I'm sick of this crap. But this idea that it's only the Jews who are pushing for politicians to do stuff for them is nonsense. Lots of ethnic groups do it. And some of this stuff is harmful. Some of it isn't. Um, regarding the DeSantis situation, I've explained it. It doesn't violate the First Amendment. It has to do with um, property rights. And it also has to do with threatening people. We're talking about we're talking about violent threats being perpetrated against people. And you know what? If whether I'm an Armenian or a Jew, I, Hungarians were targeted too, I guess, by the Russians. That, you know, how many years ago? I don't know the whole ethnic history for uh -huh. you know your ethnic background. That's, that's a little separate, yeah. but uh, you know, I'll let you finish. But no, I'm just saying. So on the Both question of Armenia, let me. It's actually a, it's perfect you brought that up because um, when regards to the Armenian question, and they do have a very powerful lobby. Actually, they used to call Armenia. I read this in Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. You can look this up. They called Armenia the Israel of the North Caucasus. And it's funny, though, that they called it the Israel of the North Caucasus. Why? Because of the aid and uh, attention they received from the U.S. State Department was equivalent to Israel. So it's kind of funny. I'm just saying it's kind of funny that Israel is used as a as an adjective or as some kind of a descriptor of receiving lots of aid and attention from the United States. But mm -hmm. aside from that, even with Armenia, let's say they might have interest in the United States. Let me ask you this. Um, how much of the United States, how many public officials or politicians did you come out and see, there were some, but not as much as recently, regarding the 120,000 ethnic Armenians that were ethnically cleansed from Nagorno-Karabakh? How many did you see? Uh, I can't recall a lot. How many have you seen come out and condemn the attacks in Israel? Let's see. Oh, quite a few, certainly. All of them, right? So, I mean, I mean, again, there not are all of them, no. There, uh, maybe except what the three the three members of the squad. So five hundred and thirty members of both five hundred and thirty members of both houses mm -hmm. were able to basically oh, condemn okay. the text. Go I ahead. Can I speak to that? Yeah, go ahead. R remember, we're, you know, we're dealing with you know we have a large you know evangelical Christian voting community yeah. in this country. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. there it is. I mean, I, I'm not afraid to admit it. I, you know, one of the, one of the reasons, not the chief reason. Okay, so relax. Uh, some of the some of the groupers in the audience might not like this, but I mean, I wanted him to move the embassy. I wanted him to move the embassy to save us money and to stabilize the region, which again helps us. That's okay. another thing about yeah. the relationship. Mm -hmm. So stabilize, and then there was the Abraham Accords, which I failed to mention. I mean, that's what Hamas is trying to do is to stop those accords. More Abraham Accords, more peace, and then we can leave us alone. Okay, you know, stop with this non, you know, deal with Islam is in full collapse. Thank God. That's another question altogether. Um, but that's why people care about Israel. I will say this, though. I think evangelical voters should be more discerning and more demanding. Um, I was, I'm with Mike Cernovich on this. I think, um, well, you guys really care about Israel, but wait a minute. You're not building our wall? And what about the January 6th people? I will submit this to you. A lot of politicians love to virtue signal. They love to virtue signal about the Cubans who are being um, persecuted. They want a virtue signal about other groups because they really can't do anything and they say something nice and everybody's happy. But when it comes to helping dealing with constitutional requirements, they can do something and they don't. And we as voters, whether evangelical, Catholic, Orthodox, Jewish, anything, we should be stepping up our citizenship authority and we should be saying, hey, y'all need to be doing your job, like dealing with this DOJ or, you know, we're going to differ on this. I'm so glad they did the motion to vacate. Kevin McCarthy did not keep his word. This is the first time I have a sense we might actually start really cutting spending in Washington because the spending is nuts, but that's another issue entirely. So, yeah, so again, um, we and a lot of Jews lot. agree with me. They don't want money going to Israel. So that undermines the dual loyalty question. Yeah. I, I, so there. Again, There's a lot um, of Jews who hate so, Israel in this country. Mm -hmm. They don't like Israel. I was, another story, if you don't mind. No, so ahead. it was at a Brad Sherman town hall because my congressman is Lion Ted Lou and he doesn't do town halls as much. But um, Brad Sherman does, and we love harassing him. A lot of my fellow Trump supporters, we, we love going there and crashing his party. And I was really stunned. There were there was a group of Jews. They were they were Jewish voters in his district, and they were all in on BDS. That yeah. doesn't sound like real loyalty to me. 
I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, these are kind of saying. anecdotal talking but, points, but we but, kind of uh, we so kind what? of address this. Truth is true. We truth address is this. So, so uh, well, I know. And if truth, truth is truth, can you provide with me the commission that debunked uh, the Jews and the Polish government? It wasn't a commission. It was a. It was a. It was a researcher. I'll have to find yeah, it. So, I mean, again, and if we're but saying that, let's just you know, because I can't give it to you so. right now, are you going to throw me away? I'm sorry. Okay. I mean, if that's your choice, that's fine. No, no, I'm, I'm not. But no, but anyways. So again, just to wrap it up, um, again, on this topic, we were talking about dual loyalty factor fiction. If there was a you know, Jewish question, Jewish influence over America, if they have loyalties to both Israel and the United States, I've asserted in the positive that they do. I think it's obvious through American foreign policy decisions, uh, through the statements of American pol uh, political figures and things of that nature through the American citizenry. Arthur is stating that there is no Jewish question and that the Zionist lobby is very limited in this country, correct? Yes. Okay. So we, we Cutter has more power. So, so yeah. So that, that 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 was that, and I had to kind of go back and forth. I apologize that's fine. to charge my phone. I appreciate so it. I'm glad yeah, I could yeah. cover. I'm glad you mentioned Kevin McDonald because I've wanted to really cut that through. I think, how, and if I may, just wrap up. How did you? I, do that? I gave you. I gave you individual examples. I gave you the you example of Karl Marx. I'm talking I'm about an example. Anecdotal example. Um, example um, anecdotal works. That, that's appropriate because that undermines a general thesis. And then, oh, I'll, here's the other one: the NAACP. Kevin McDonald asserts, and he even did it in an interview, the NAACP was founded by Jews. No, it wasn't. Two Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Yep, he said that. He was wrong. There's another yeah. one. But the point is, it's punching holes in this larger argument. Steve Pinker was too lazy. Oh, I'm not going to waste my time with this book. Wrong. We do have to debate with this, as Dr. Lazarowitz told her, the students at Cal State Long Beach. Okay. Okay, so there. let's move on to the next four. topic. Agreed? Agreed? All right, so next one. Um, is American aid, and I think we might agree on this one, is American aid necessary for Israel any longer? Would you like to start or would you like me to go? No. Can we just put this to bed? No. Okay. No. It's unconstitutional. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I, agree um, I think there shouldn't be any aid to Israel just for a couple facts. If people are talking with people they know or okay. people who uh, you know, are supportive of the state of Israel, just a couple of points of contact. Israel has a higher per capita uh gdp meaning people who make higher yearly salaries and things of that nature than the united kingdom so this is an extremely wealthy country i don't see why we don't send the uk any foreign aid as far as i know um i don't yeah. see why we should be sending israel any foreign aid um yeah. also i think uh israeli uh i think sending foreign aid in general outside the united states um isn't good it's a waste of our tax dollars and um, I think it, it's not really an effective means, I think, of uh, keeping uh, influence over other countries. Maybe you might. I think you've actually agreed in the positive, too, that you don't want uh, Israel to receive any American aid. My, I think when I hear from people that uh, Israel should receive our aid, that it is kind of a good way of keeping them on a leash, so to speak, and uh, keeping them under our thumb or having them do things we want to do to move towards peace with the Palestinians. I don't think that's been effective. You would probably agree the same um, to some degree. Right, so, people uh, that I, I would say I would just say it's. It's not a good thing to do anymore. It doesn't make any sense um, from a monetary perspective. Uh, Israel can take care of itself, and uh, we don't need to send any money. Do you want to elaborate on that any further? I, I do, and I just think this is hilarious. I, I just a special shout out to Mr. Lawrence of Europa. There, I love this guy. Shopper is all 100% spewing Dennis Prager talking points. 100%, really? I mean, th this just goes right back to how silly this becomes. I have what, you know, Prager U, there's a video, I'm sure you know about it, in which you have a general who argues we should send more money to Israel. I have watched that video, and you know what? That's the worst video on the channel. I disagree with it 100%. But you see, it's these sloppy generalizations that people are making that Mr. Europa here is uh, giving an example of. And if I may be so bold, this is what some adulterating or... Um, mis, uh, mischaracterizing the Arab-Israeli conflict. It is the same issue that um, uh, you know undermines and um, demonizes Jews. It pushes this whole you know the, the whole Jewish question nonsense. It's because of this generalization stuff. And uh, I'm happy to keep calling it out. I think it's kind of funny. Well, Everybody, take a look at that. I'm spewing spewing a hundred percent Dennis Prager talking points, and I don't want Israel to get any of our money, which is like one of the chief Dennis Prager talking points. And he's not even changing so, his comment. <laughs> so I, I understand. Aside from your disagreements with people in the chat, Arthur, <laughs> Arthur, do you want to elaborate though any more on uh, if American aid for Israel okay. is necessary? I, I, why, I, yeah. I want to say this to all my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. 
you can still love Israel without giving them money. A friendship shouldn't be based on money. Um, that's not a good friendship at all. Um, I think I go back to George Washington. Let's have peace and commerce, but in times of war, we fight. Um, I think that's you know that's appropriate. When I said let's not send any money even to Israel, um, somebody commented that's anti-Semitic. No, it's not. In fact, that's a stupid charge because Israel doesn't have Jews only, but there are Christians and Muslims. Duh. Um, we we have to take away. Um, we've got to change the thinking though on a broader level. People shouldn't be our government government spends too much money and it does too much and it's it's got to stop and and a great way is stop the corporate welfare and stop with the foreign aid done okay all right so i think we addressed that question yeah um i think you and i both agreed essentially no more aid for israel though correct yeah okay that's great well um again should america okay what's fine next topic huh yes what's yeah, what's so number five yeah, should America intervene militarily if Israel is threatened? So, so guys, so, so you want to start on that author? You seem pretty excited. Sure. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. We have to intervene because Americans have been killed. Now, what does intervene mean? Does it mean boots on the ground? No, I'm not ready for that. Um, but we need to. American citizens, that citizenship matters, right? That's like, that was a fundamental tenet of your, of your campaign. Citizenship is being watered down in this country with, you know, and all the illegal stories. We need to care about American citizens, right? And American citizens have been killed, murdered in Israel because of Hamas. So we have a right to do something about that. Now, what should we do? We need more information because you're right. I mean, we've seen one foray after another. Um, Americans are getting killed in Ukraine as well. Um, but to me, it's like, that's more likely because of intervention. We really need to be very careful about getting involved in these nettlesome conflicts. Um, Walter Williams talked about this. As much as possible, we really need to remove ourselves from these conflicts. But we shouldn't allow Americans to just be killed arbitrarily when they were just visiting. They weren't even engaged in a conflict when going to Israel. So, but I, I don't know where we should go with this next because again hey israel's taking care of business let them do it and i will put this out there and i'll get a lot of hate from the pro-palestinian front they need to take back gaza they need to wipe out all this nonsense they need to retake they should have never given it away they should have never, never given so, it away so you're advocating i just want to make sure if you're advocating for the israeli conquest of the gaza strip and I don't want to put words in your mouth i'm not gonna you just did it, though. The, 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 the <laughs> said reconquest. i didn't say reconquest I said, take it back. I mean, they, they gave it out and look what they've done. They've turned it into a third world hell hole yeah. and they've turned it into a it's, 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 it's synonymous. So, and aside from that, I'm just saying, so you, yeah. you're in favor yeah. of taking it back though, right? Israeli. Absolutely. Israel, and you know so what? More, a so lot of Arabs, a lot of Arabs would agree. Egypt does not allow Palestinians to come into Egypt. Well, Egypt they also hasn't like closed the Egypt also hasn't closed its border uh, with uh, Gaza through the Sinai Peninsula, and supplies have been going through. They've also lit up the Cairo mm -hmm. Tower with the color of solidarity with. Uh, that's not the Egyptian and, government doing it. That's uh, you know, again, those you know Islamic interests doing it, and that's another thing we have to be very careful. About. It goes back okay. to the Levant affair. It was well, I mean, Mohammed Sisi, it, he had a bunch of Mohammed so. Sisi, the current president of Egypt. Yeah, I mean, I think he's been. I don't think they would have allowed the Cairo Tower to get lit up uh, without his say-so. But we can go into that, a whole other thing. So, uh, again, are you saying, uh, just real quick, going back to the question, though, do you believe that the uh, Gaza Strip should be retaken militarily by Israel yes. and that the Palestinians should be removed, or what, what's their status? So, what how, integrating, integrating the general population, boy, that's a tougher question, because we've had decades of indoctrination. Again, part of it paid with American money. It makes me sick to my stomach that has been bombarding to these Arab children to hate Jews, hate Israel, destroy Jews, and destroy America. Okay, getting back to America first, right? Um, how do you integrate this? How do you deal with this situation? It's a tough one. That's why the conflict is still going on. Um, but I think fundamentally, I said there was a two-state solution at the outset. I think we need to be integrating more towards that. We need to stop with the poisonous propaganda that teaches kids to hate Jews and that Jews are the, their, their problems or Christians for that matter, or Americans for that matter. Um, we need to stop allowing these creepy dictators and these Islamic leaders to take our money. You know, we're talking about giving money to Israel. Money is going to Palestinian nonsense as well. well this is vile. What the hell's your going stance, on? Your stance though on the two state solution, I don't want to mischaracterize it, is that Israel is a state and Jordan is a state where the Palestinians- That was how it was set up. Yeah. That, that was the two state solution. Now, okay. what are we going to do now? 
boy, that's a tough one. Um, it's going to take a while. Um, but I, I just, I, I just go back to if I have a choice between living in Nablus or living in Tel Aviv. Ugh, well, Tel Aviv maybe not so good because they have the second largest gay pride parade. And boy, do I hate that. Uh, but I'd still rather uh -huh. live in Israel. I think a lot of Arabs would too. Now, how this is going to get resolved in the long term, how you deal with, how you get people to see properly what's going on, boy, that's a tough one. But the starting point is we can't allow Hamas to have these strong points of military, you know, military attack to harm and harass innocent civilians. This must stop and take back Gaza as a good starting place. Okay, and yep. uh, earlier you mentioned that the citizens that have been killed uh, in Israel are U.S. citizens, but... I mean, do we know like how long these people have been in the United uh, have been in Israel? Like these could have been settlers, maybe that were killed that have been there twenty, twenty five years. Maybe that's yeah, a good question. I mean, so at that point, or they were like, visiting, I mean, there, are they there was some kind of a rave going on when the Hamas no, that's, paratroopers? No, that's one instance. That's one instance for sure. No, that's one so. instance for sure. But there's also you know where they're going to settlements and things around the Gaza Strip. Um, you know, we we don't know everyone that's been there. That's my point. It's kind of these questions too. I mean, look, okay. uh, if there's you citizens over there being killed i think we kind of need to be discerning about it because it's the same thing the argument they tried to use uh when the afghani americans uh were left behind in afghanistan and oh we need to bring these people back well these people probably went over to afghanistan to work with the american government i mean they, they, and same thing with israel like these, these uh u.s citizens that are going over there a lot of them could have been settlers there for a long time and at some point i mean yes that's unfair i mean if they came yesterday they're there on a trip and they die i mean yeah that's unfortunate but it's like if you've yeah. been there 20 25 years it's kind of it's kind of an interesting question so we have to kind of be honest about that um is there anything you'd like to finish though on your point on american intervention for israel before i start or no <laughs> i love it um i think it's this is to the general audience the groiper um arthur prager is demanding American soldiers go die in apartheid ethno state Israel. <laughs> I just said we shouldn't bring soldiers in. <laughs> I said we got to protect Americans. No, I, I love it. And Arthur, so just, just uh, this is part of the reason I to do this. The general audience needs to understand this is the game that gets played. Yeah. The, the, the words get twisted, and it's nothing but lies. Okay. Okay. So. So again, I'm just I'm gonna, I'm so I don't, um, here's the thing, I'm on American military intervention with Israel. Um, I believe America is actually treaty bound to defend Israel. I can't cite the specific treaty, but I think, I think you're familiar with that. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm in support of that. I don't think America should be in treaties with other uh, nations, especially ones in contentious areas such as Israel. Uh, but I think that's kind of the reality. So if we are treaty bound, um, again, I think America will have to essentially uh, abide by it. I mean, that's the legalese of it. But um, do now, um, now, do I agree with that, though? Um, no, I don't. I don't agree with that. Um, if, it, if I were the president, if it were a perfect world, um, I wouldn't support any military intervention on behalf of Israel. My, um, my point is that Israel can defend itself. Um, uh, this was touted prior to the Palestinians rolling in on paragliders and motorcycles with old machine guns. Um, this was touted as the toughest military uh, in the Middle East. This was touted as a country that had an uh, in, uh, impenetrable um, anti-missile air defense system with the Iron Dome, American Patriots, and the Palestinians have used essentially cheap drones and uh, bottle rockets and have caused heavy damage over the last couple of days. So, um, you know, again, aside from all that, though, do, should, we uh, should we get uh, involved if Israel's threatened? Um, I don't believe we should. Um, again, now, will that happen? Um, again, I think we are treaty bound, so I think that, that could happen, and I'm not for that. But um, do I think it should happen? No, I think America should only act uh, when its strategic interests are threatened, um, and that primarily comes in our Western Hemisphere, for example, on our southern border. Um, I don't think what happens in Israel is uh, necessarily uh, going to affect you or I tomorrow. Um, honestly, I think if you, want my, if you want my official position, too, I mean, I think the Palestinians could potentially retake the entire country, and I don't think it would change American security at all. Um, and actually, you could argue that American security, I think, for the last 20 years, or at least in my life, even go back 30 years, 31 years, has been uh, severely, uh, American, American security has been severely deteriorated due to our relationship with Israel. It's been detrimental, and um, I don't really see any positives to it. But uh, again, on American military intervention, I would say Israel is a wealthy country. Uh, they have purportedly a great military with planes, Apache helicopters, heavy equipment, um, a trained army. Um, I think also they have one of the most world's most armed populations too. And um, I, it's not good know, enough. They don't have a second yeah. amendment. They need to work on that. Yeah. But I'm just saying, so 
Uh, with all that being said, given that they have a armed population and they're a wealthy country with a purportedly uh, good military and, and, and elaborate intelligence system, I don't think we should get involved. That's my stance. The population isn't armed. I just, we have to it's just be speaking general truth, you know, that regarding, you know, intervention is another issue. They're not all armed. The teachers are armed because they often, you know, Hamas and the other terrorists, they target the kids. So the teachers have guns, but there's not general gun ownership. That needs to change. More countries need to have a Second Amendment. Gun ownership Hong in Israel Kong, is quite high. Hong, Hong Kong should have had a Second Amendment. They wouldn't have been reabsorbed into China, but again, that's another issue. Okay, um, I, th I think I've given my position on that. Um, time will tell. If more Americans get killed, we need to do something more. Um, I don't believe in boots on the ground. I don't think it's necessary. I think Israel has plenty of their own boots. Let them do it. Okay, uh, um, and I just want to look up here real quick. So I just want to verify, and this isn't a gotcha. I'm just verifying gun ownership in Israel. If I'm wrong, I'll be the first to admit. Oh, if I'm um, wrong, I'm happy to hear it. No, no, yeah. Uh, okay, it says, I'm looking at something here from the BBC. It says, Israeli gun ownership rising as violence surges. But I'm scrolling okay. through it. It doesn't really give a percentage or anything. But then it also does um, say, too, according to uh, the, uh, it looks like an Israeli government site, it says, no one may own or carry a gun without a showing a reason to do so. A special permit, permit by the interior minister is then required. The permit must have the approval of police and includes information about the owner and gun type. So I gotta, I gotta beg the cops for a gun. Yeah. Wow, that sucks. So it is interesting. I mean, again, if I'm wrong on the ownership, I believe I've read that Israeli gun ownership is quite high. Um, you know, well, regardless, I mean, okay, you made yeah. your point. Okay. Yeah. So that's it. We'll move on, and uh, this is going to be kind of the last final point here, and we'll kind of sure. make this our uh, final, uh, you know, points, and you can kind of just leave it all out on the field, so to speak. Um, so, conclusion and prognostications for the future. Uh, do you want us to go, Arthur, or do you want me to go? Oh, I just open up the Bible. Um, I just go from for the biblical record. Um, you're going to see more Jews fleeing from Europe, from Africa. Um, you know, there will be more Jews moving into Israel. Um, I do sadly predict that there will be more hostility for Christians. Um, it won't work uh, because the gospel is spreading. Um, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pre-trib guy, so there's going to be a rapture. Um, there will be a the false messiah who is going to make an agreement with the jews to protect them from all the other countries i'm giving a biblical response that's that's the prognostication i'm giving and uh you know there'll be that set there'll be three and a half years of peace then three and a half years of betrayal um i don't know where the millions of millions of armed personnel will be coming from whether it's russia china or babylon china seems like the most likely one that was how lindsay's argument and you know israel the jews will be surrounded well at the same time there'll be 144,000 jews who believe in jesus will be preaching the gospel uh and they'll be trying to save as many people during the tribulation um you know revelation says there's two witnesses i think it's moses and elijah because elijah never died moses came back to life and then when all is about to be lost when israel's about to be wiped out jesus will show up and that's why you're seeing more Jews moving there. That's a fundamental reason why I care about Israel. I don't like the government all the time. Obviously, I just shared that with you. Um, I think that our relationship should remain. I think it needs to be a balanced relationship. I want to see more, and I believe there will be more Abraham Accords. It's going to happen. Saudi Arabia is about to join. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing on the broad scale because, again, the world's getting more secular. It's getting more lost. Uh, but. I think that our relationship will stay a little longer. Canada's going to break away because the Muslims have so much power in Canada now. Um, those are just my general insights on what's going to happen going forward. Okay. Um, thank you, Arthur. Uh, my conclusions and prognostications for the future. Uh, first, I think um, Israel's running on borrowed time in the region. Um, I think these recent attacks demonstrate that. I think the Palestinians have shown a capability and a sense of bravery and a sense of uh, ideological commitment that far exceeds those of the uh, Israeli Zionist settlers that have been in the country for well over a century since this project first started in the late 19th century. So um, I'd say that I think um, what I think is going to happen in this particular conflict, and maybe I'm in a minority here, um, I don't think Israel is going to have this resounding uh, defeat of the Palestinian insurgents. Um, and if they do, it's going to come at a great cost, far greater than any of the previous wars they've been in. If you look at some of the sources, um, I think they've said that these casualties they've accumulated in the last several days um, are greater than the six-day war already. So, I mean, uh, initially, so it's, it's pretty impressive, or at least those first couple of days, it tracks with the casualties they have. The point is, it's it's been uh, extreme, extremely damaging to Israel. And I think one thing people haven't brought up with this is that um, – 
this was a preemptive attack by Hamas in response to in, by in response to um, what Israel had been doing to uh, religious settlers in Al Aqsa. That's why it's called the Al Aqsa flood. And um, there was a great suspicion that after the holidays, the Israelis were going to essentially start a, their own preemptive attack um, hmm. on the Palestinians on the West Bank. And and I and again, I'm not an expert on Israeli military history. But you can tell me, I believe it was either the Yom Kippur War or the Six Day War, the one either in 73 or 67, where the Israelis, under the same circumstances, did a preemptive attack and have justified their uh, for doing so. So I'm just saying this isn't a, uh, you know, these people, even going back to when it was the British Mandate, these people would do kind of these, un these surprise attacks on each other. This is a. This is long going on, but the point I'm making is just on prognostications for the future is I think uh, Israel's running on borrowed time. I think that the uh, Palestinians are receiving <coughs> solidarity from the Arabic and Islamic states. And I think what might happen from this conflict, I mean, I don't know if they'll be able to take over the whole country. Israel has an impressive military and intelligence apparatus. But if some kind of land corridor, I think, was established with the West Bank, and uh, some kind of lasting situation where there could be a cohesive Palestinian geography rather than this, uh, you know, separated enclave in the West Bank, um, I think that would be better off. And I think that the Israelis, if they do want to have a long term, because uh, I actually am, I'm in favor of a two state solution. Now, when you said, does Israel have a right to exist? Well, I mean, no country has a right to exist. History can determine if they do or not. I mean, uh, the Armenian, the. Hold I don't, on, I don't find that persuasive. I'm kidding. It's a very dangerous territory if you start saying that. I just, well, I mean, look, we just saw the Armenians of Nagorno Karabakh, who, <laughs> who had been there for thousands of years. I mean, their existence wasn't guaranteed, was it not? And it, they were driven there, out. There are rights and then there are guarantees of the, those rights. That's yeah. where the question comes in. Yeah, I guess, so, I mean, I mean, I mean do, I think, do I think the Jewish, do I think the Jewish state, do I think the Jews should have a state and they should exist? Yes, I think every every group of people are entitled uh, to a state to some degree. Um, but again, um, is it guaranteed? I don't know, and, 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 and I can't say that, but- um, That's why good, good laws and good arms matter, Machiavelli. But yeah, so, so just to end it up, though, um, I think uh, this is actually boding well for the Palestinians. I don't think they're going to be crushed. Um, I think America should actually take a look at this conflict and reassess um, the competence of Israel as an ally and uh, the utility of using them as a partner in the region even further. And I think this should also actually um, encourage us to maybe um, kind of broker some kind of agreement or bring Iran back to the negotiating table. And kind of maybe instead of uh, doing peace in the style of the Abraham Accords, which I think is just favorable to Israel and their benefits, I think we should have a genuine uh, kind of Middle Eastern conference once this uh, debate or this conflict ends. And, and the result of that conference is death to Israel. That's what it comes down to, because it's in the religion. That's This is what it's about. I, I remember talking to one Lebanese who, he sold me my first car, by the way. And he's like, oh, it's just about land. And it's like, yeah, because it says it in this book, you know, the Quran, or it says in this book, the Torah, you know, or it says in this book, the Bible. This is a part of what has made this so contentious has been the religious sentiments that undergird it. And that's when you got to get into larger arguments about is the Quran telling the truth? Is the Bible telling the truth? And, you know, that brings up another set of arguments. You know, the Quran is filled with contradictions. The Quran distorts biblical narrative even though Muhammad himself asserts that his religion is built upon the Torah and the Christian Bible or the, the New Testament, um, it is it is shocking the amount of contradictions. You're finding more Arabs, they abandon Islam and they're believing in Jesus. And then they stop hating Jews because it's almost like a choke like it, it's almost like a cult like chokehold on their minds because it's indoctrinated into them early. You know, there and these programs were happening before Israel was even formed as a state. This happened beforehand. Uh, you know, anti-Semitism has just turned into an easy policy for Islamic leaders to justify their own failures. And just it's the Jews fault. And uh, they rely on the same tropes that were used by some medieval you know, types. Uh, but and again, I find that with a lot of the people on the populist right, you know, there's all this negative towards Jews and this whole Jewish question stuff that I have responded to, I have debunked, but it's not going to be accepted because it's a deeper issue. Um, I don't have the answer yet. Um, I hope, hope I get it someday. You know, what, you know, you've got like, I think a lot of people believe what they hear in colleges and it's anti-Israel. It's just nonstop. I even had, I was even doing an email communication with Chemerinsky up in Berkeley because I went to UC Irvine. So that's part of how I knew about him. I'm like, 
you guys have people that they can say Israel doesn't have a right to exist, but you have groups that want to do something else and they're not allowed to speak. What's going on here? And Chemerinsky, he also said, we don't want white professors. We don't want conservative professors. And there's so much dishonesty. There's so much, um, well, there certainly aren't free debates like this in the college campuses. It's if you if you wave an Israeli flag, flag, you get screamed at, yelled at. If you wear a Palestinian flag, you're a hero. That's gotten worse, not better. Um, I went to UC Irvine. There was a huge, you know, an Arab or Muslim presence even when I was there 20 years ago. Um, I was also on Wally George's show, but I, I don't usually brag about that too much. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> okay. Um, um, yes. Least, can I ask this question? Can I ask this question? Do you see a moral yeah, limit? Like you ask you a question. Moral, go ahead. You want to ask me a question? No, well, I you, you go first, and I'll ask you. Yeah, then you ask me. Okay. Do you see a moral equivalence, like they're on the same level, um, the Palestinians and the Israelis? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think I've been pretty uh, open in that throughout this art. I, I support the Palestinians. Okay, you summer. Yeah. So, so I mean, actually, I, I, you favor I mean, the Palestinians. You favor yeah, the Palestinians. Okay. I think they're, I think they're heroic. I think they're heroes. Does that answer your question? It, it, it does answer the question. Yeah, you, you've made your position very clear. I think, okay. I, think, um, I think the Palestinians are some of the bravest people on the face of the planet. And uh, my heart goes out for them, and I hope they're successful. So um, okay. I'd, also, I'd also like to say this. Um, you brought Did this, you have I mean, a question Christian. you want to ask me, though? Yeah, question yeah, no, that me? is. Yeah, so you're Christian, um, and I'm pretty sure you're, you consume a lot of right-wing media. You see the stuff that's going on. I mean, how can you as a Christian uh, circle the square when Israel has provided arms to, I think, a terrorist government in Azerbaijan that has ethnically cleansed Armenians from the Nagorno-Karabakh enclave and Artsakh, and they provided large arms. And also, aside from that, you have Jewish settlers spitting on Christians. Oh, I've holidays. seen that. I'm yeah, glad and, you and bring that's, that up. And that's actually been uh, Jewish settlers and Jewish religious figures have come out and said that that's an acceptable tradition. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, just and, and let okay. me and let, so just to wrap it up on that question too. Um, connecting all together, I mean, I think there is this obvious uh, anti-Christian, anti-European, anti-Goy sentiment uh, in the Jewish faith, and I think obviously some of that's borne out as a Christian. I mean, uh, I, I'll give you a book. I haven't read this book. I've seen this man lecture. His name's Peter Schaffer, a Jewish man. He wrote a book called Christ and the Talmud. Maybe you're familiar with it. He says that sure. in the Talmud. He says in the Talmud, which isn't a single text, it's many rabbinical volumes. He sure. says that in the Talmud that Christ is burning in a cauldron of feces and semen. And that mm -hmm. Mary was a whore who's, who had sex right. with a Roman soldier. So, I mean, again, okay. uh, being a Christian, let me ask you, how do you, how do you circle that square being an, an ardent Zionist? I, and I hope I'm not mischaracterizing because you said you were a Zionist. Maybe you're not ardent. Sure. But uh, how, how could you circle that square being a Zionist given Israeli support for Islamic regimes that have ethnically cleansed Christians, given uh, their religious beliefs uh, denying the divinity of our Savior and the treatment mm -hmm. of modern-day Christians in the Israeli state? Okay. So I guess the first question I would ask is on the ground currently, um, now this might seem like a uh, this might seem like a false equivalence, but this is even what you have Orthodox Jews in Israel. Um, they've been they have been vocally critical when they call them hyper Orthodox are attacking Christians. I've seen the videos. You have hyper Orthodox that were blocking Christians from coming into a place. Um, there were Christians who were worshiping, and there were hyper Orthodox that were trying to wave the cameras out. You don't see them taking out guns and shooting them. You don't see them blowing them up. You don't see them stripping them them naked and parading them in the street. That's what you see Hamas doing. And that's what you see Indians, um, Hindu nationalists doing. I really want to, I'm really calling out the Narendra Modi nonsense. You know, Trump was all with the Howdy Modi, but nobody's going after India and the abuse of, the murder, murder of Christians, okay? Jews are not killing Christians. Now, second of all, people don't believe in Jesus. There's going to be a hostility to it. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't recall recently any Jews strapping bombs to themselves and blowing up public spaces, but this is what, this is what Muslims do. This is what they're taught to do. This is what you're seeing Arabs do. There is a manifold difference. Now, regarding the Talmud, that's interesting. The Talmud is not inscribed. It's not inspired scripture by any stretch. Uh, it's um, it's full of contradictions, and you want to know why? I think you touched on it because they argue with each other. It's a yes, bunch of Jews. It's rabbinical arguing volumes, to my understanding. Yes, they're arguing yeah, with each other. Now, there's going to be some of these rabbis who say really mean things about Jesus. I'm not surprised. But you know what? A lot of Jews don't even read the Talmud, or they don't observe it. Many of the Jews are very secular, actually. I mean, second largest gay pride parade. Mm. That doesn't exactly sound orthodox, right? No, yeah, right? you're right. No, yeah. Uh, the Talmud.
episode is, is full of contradictions as it's supposed to. It is not inspired. There was an excellent debate between a Jewish Christian and uh, there, was a, there was a Talmudist, you know, trying to defend the Talmud and the Christians. He used to be a Jew, now he's a Christian, and he's like, the Talmud is not inspired, it's not accepted, it didn't prophesy anything. I don't care what the Talmud says. Now, this is kind of interesting, because I would be saying it to the hardcore anti-Semitic groypers, you guys know more about the Talmud than the Jews do. Are you Jewish? I'd be teasing them a little bit. But, um, you know, in, in Islam, they say, you know, they say nice things about, no, they say nice things about Jesus, but they lie about Jesus. And again, it's, um, I know this is an argument we can't discuss right now. Um, I know about the dancing Israelis conspiracy. No, Israel did not do 9-11. Sorry, if you had 19 hijackers, I think our government was involved in it. I think we can handle that discussion now because of how the government shut us all in and made us take vaccines that we didn't want or need. Um, but it's, uh, it's Islam that says, you know, kill Christians and kill Jews. It's not Judaism. It's certainly not the Torah. Now the Talmud, I know there's a passage where it says, you know, kill the Gentiles. But that was a discussion about Exodus because there's this issue. There were some of Pharaoh's soldiers who were forced to pursue the Israelites. And so the question becomes, should they die too? And the answer is one, one of the rabbis says they should die too. That isn't to say that all the Gentiles have to die. It's a very nice trick that people like, I guess, Nick Quintes or Kevin McDonald, if they do this or anybody else, they take passages of the Talmud and they give this presentation that all the Jews are trying to kill us. And it's simply not true. Yeah. And so, and before we wrap up, I just want to give one last thing, if you'd be so kind to entertain me here. So uh, there was today um, also, and I'm going to kind of push back because you're saying that the Israelis, I think are from what, Again, I don't want to mischaracterize you, and I know you're filming it, so I, we're being totally transparent here. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think you're saying that the Israelis show more restraint towards Christians and Muslims. Is that correct? Or there's more of a there's more of a pro in this conflict. There's less of a likelihood of uh, Christians having ethno religious excesses rather than Muslims. Correct? Muslims are going and blowing up Christians and Jews indiscriminately, whereas Israel's not trying to do that. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah. I don't want to mischaracterize correct. you. That is correct. Okay, okay. You'll find it. And I know you can point to me, Menachem Begin. I, I, I've always wanted to respond to this. No, I know no, 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 no. I just, well, it's actually yeah. in the context, because what happened was um, in this conflict the last couple of days, Hamas fighters and these Palestinian fighters, it's been documented, it's been going on social media, people have been talking about it. They've had orders to protect Christian religious sites, whereas the Israeli Air Force. Oh, I've heard um, about that. The sure. Israeli Air Force just obliterated a mosque. I mean, so again, I, okay. I mean, and there's a whole. You know, again, we, we've talked for a long time. You want to know why? You want to know why? You want to know why? Easy, because they're taking advantage of the Arab Christians. They're playing them off okay. uh, of that's the Jews. That's your assertion? Yes. That's your assertion? Okay. And I think All it's right. really sad. I'm very upset. I think I have a friend of mine whose father was born in Jerusalem during the British mandate. So it was a very contentious time. And, you know, it, it caused me to really rethink things, you know. I understand it was a very difficult time for a lot of people. And I'm not neglecting. I'm sure some Jews did some bad things, too. But... You, you've got, it's not, not, it is not the express policy to wipe out all of Arabs. In fact, you have Arabs in the government in Israel. There are no Jews in any government anywhere in the Arab world. In fact, all the Jews were kicked out. And the Christians are, are doing too well either. In fact, the only reason there are still Christians in Egypt is because of al-Sisi taking over, thank God. But when Gaddafi was deposed, thank you, Obama, um, Jews were expelled, and I think I think Christians were expelled too. But, but Jews, Jews anyway, nobody out, cares about Jews, Christians, right? Jews were kicked out, but they had a state to go to. Where have Palestinians gone to? Or, they, they're languishing. They, in, they have not been allowed camps. to. Thank you for oh, thank you for bringing that yeah. up. They were they, they were not allowed to go to Jordan, and that was part of the deal. And the, the Arabs deliberately create this problem. So the yeah. Islamic militants they created this. The Jews are bad. Look at what they're doing to the Arabs. Well, you're not allowing them. Well, I mean, it's kind of, okay. and remember, I mean, they were allowed. And I'll assert mm -hmm. again: Arabs are allowed to serve in the Knesset. Arabs serve on the Israeli Supreme Court. You have Muslims on the Supreme Court. Holy crap! I mean, that's why the right wing is. And, you know, and, and let's be honest. You know, I love being critical too. You know, BB is not as conservative as you think. The guy's okay with abortion. He's okay with gay marriage. And because he was soft on these issues, that's why the right wing has more power. If he had actually had some principles. And had cared about babies and marriage, he wouldn't have these. Um, he wouldn't. He wouldn't have some more radical elements pressuring him. Well, that's another story. To, to, and I'll wrap it up on this. As you alluded to too, though, and I think we could all agree. I mean, Israeli society and uh, 
is Israel itself isn't a monolith, you know, and there's a lot of uh, there's secular Jews, there's Correct. Orthodox Jews, there's nationalists. I mean, there's been Israel up to the lead up to this. I mean, it's actually had a very tumultuous year politically with uh, battles over the judiciary and a lot of uh, various protests. Yeah. So, I mean, it's been oh, a very um, animated year in Israel, to say the least. But um, I'll just wrap it up. Arthur, at least uh, we hashed it out. We've talked a minute. Did you at least feel that you were given a fair platform uh, today and that you had a good time on the debate? That that's a that I think that's a fair assessment. Um, I really appreciate you doing this at the last minute. I didn't want this to wait. I'm I'm glad we could do this. Uh, I it's just kind of like I want to be able to respond to this stuff, and it was appropriate. And uh, you can tell everybody, you know, you reached out to somebody who said let's talk about it, and I said let's do it. Oh no, yeah, because other activists didn't want to. It's it's uh, I'm not gonna name names, but there were people who did it. And you, Arthur, I respect. I mean, even though we have divergent opinions on a lot of things, I will say I've seen you debate. Many people, um, I've seen you always be willing to stand in the trench, and I appreciate you coming on today and taking an hour, nearly two hours, to kind of flesh oh, this out. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's it. So again, Arthur, thank you very much. I think you've been a good sport. I hope you feel like been the same. I hope we can maybe have future debates in the future. And um, okay. God bless everyone. And I think we can all agree that we want peace around the world in the near future. Do we not? When Christ comes, when not all if. All right. Well, thank you guys. Uh, God bless everyone who tuned in, and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. And if we're but saying that, let's just know, because I can't give it to you so. right now, are you going to throw me away? I'm sorry. Okay. I mean, if that's your choice, that's fine. No, no, I'm, I'm not. But no, fine. but anyways. So again, just to wrap it up. Um, again, on this topic, we we're talking about dual loyalty, factor fiction. If there was a you know, Jewish question, Jewish influence over America, if they have loyalties to both Israel and the United States, I've asserted in the positive that they do. I think it's obvious through American foreign policy decisions. Uh, through the statements of American pol uh, political figures and things of that nature through the American citizenry.